Good evening, everyone. It is 6 o'clock p.m., and we are at our Cape Canaveral City Council regular meeting here at the City Hall Council Chambers, located at 100 Polk Avenue, Cape Canaveral, Florida, 32920. It is February, February 20th, 2024, and uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I call this meeting to order. Councilmember Willis, would you please lead us in the pledge? Thank you. City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Here. Mayor Morrison? Here. Councilmember Willis? Here. Thank you, Council. Mayor Pro Tem, for all being here. This time we will approve the agenda as written or make any amendments. Council, do we have any requests for changes to the agenda? I make a motion to approve as written. I'll second. Got a motion by Council Member Willis, second by Council Member Davis to approve the agenda as written. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, City Clerk. Council Member Davis? Four. Council Member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council Member Willis? Four. Wonderful. So the first part of our meeting is the presentations and interviews portion. First presentation is a proclamation declaring March 2024 as Irish American Heritage Month. Here in the city of Cape Canaveral, I believe we have Mr. Keith Reynolds here uh, representing the ancient order of Hi Hibernier sorry, Hibernians. Keith, are you here? Hey, Scott, thank you. This time I'll, I'll read the proclamation, and if you'd like to say a few words after, I'm happy to take a photograph as well. And with that, official proclamation of the city of Cape Canaveral, Florida, whereas by 1776, nearly 300,000 Irish nationals had immigrated to the American colonies and played a crucial role in America's war for independence and whereas five signers of the Declaration of Independence were of Irish descent, three signers were Irish born, and at least 22 presidents of the United States have proudly proclaimed their Irish American heritage. And whereas Irish born Commodore John Barry fought the last sea battle of the American Revolution off the coast of Florida and was recognized by the United States Congress in September of 2002 as the first flag officer of the United States Navy. And whereas the Irish first came to Spanish La Florida in the 1500s, first as missionaries and mercenary soldiers, and then as planters, traders, businessmen, doctors, and administrators, and three of the Spanish governors of La Florida were Irish military officers. And whereas Father Richard Arthur, an Irish-born priest from Limerick, who was appointed parish priest of St. Augustine in 1597, an ecclesiastical judge of La Florida, established the first public school in America and opened it to both boys and girls of all races. And whereas Irish Floridians can look back with pride on the legacy of their Irish forebears who have contributed significantly to American education, business, sports, literature, science, engineering, medicine, and the arts. And whereas Irish Americans since America's inception have provided and continue to provide leadership and service to this nation's political business and religious establishments. And whereas it is fitting and proper to celebrate the rich cultural heritage and the many valuable contributions of Irish Americans. Now, therefore, I, Wes Morrison, mayor of the city of Cape Canaveral, Brevard County, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2024 as 
Irish American Heritage Month, signed and sealed this 20th day of February 2024. Thank you. I'll come down and join you. American Heritage Month is very important to you know, the entire community here, especially in Cape Canaveral. Um, interesting point, you mentioned Commodore John Barry. Uh, here in Cape Canaveral, out at Jetty Park, we actually have a plaque uh, commemorating um, Commodore Barry's accomplishments uh, in that Revolutionary War. Um, as the other side note is um, invite all of you to come out to our St. Patrick's Day Parade on the 16th. Uh, it's going to be down in Melbourne, but it's still going to be a Great time, fun time for all to be able to celebrate this uh, day. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next is a presentation by Zachary Marchetti, Community Engagement and Outreach Officer for the Brevard Zoo to provide an update on the progress of the proposed 14-acre aquarium and Conservation Center at Port Canaveral. Zachary, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, as I think everybody knows at this point, we have some pretty exciting things going on in the Brevard Zoo. And so uh, we are in the middle of our legacy campaign. And our legacy campaign is our current $100 million campaign to both continue to support the zoo, because the zoo is who we are, it's our heart, it's our proof of concept, right? Um, but also to build this new incredible facility right here at Port Canaveral. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and this new facility will follow, just like Brevard Zoo, the same entrepreneurial, independent, nonprofit business model um, and really ensure that we are paying our own way and adding to the community um, in every step as long as we can um, while providing the same interactive experiences that we've all known to grow or grown to know and love from Brevard Zoo. Um, and then last but certainly not least, first and foremost, this facility will increase the reach and capacity of what we do because our zoo already does some incredible things for the local environment. Um, and we'll talk about those and kind of how that's expanding a little bit here. Um, next slide, please. Um, but first, kind of where we stand with our current campaign. This is a $100 million campaign that we launched in late 2021 after signing our land agreement with the port. We're currently sitting at just under $75 million pledged towards that $100 million campaign. This is exponentially larger than anything that we've done um, and are so incredibly honored and appreciative of all of the community members that have stepped up and supported this project already. But we also know that we still have a ways to go. Um, not only are we still you know, working towards that $100 million goal, but this is a plan that we launched in 2021. And I think we all know what cost $100 million in 2021 um, but those prices have not gone down since that day. So we know that when this fall hits, when next year hits, when opening day hits, our fundraising doesn't stop. We're in campaign mode to continue to grow and build the things that we do. Um, but we are already seeing a result of this campaign on the work that we're doing for our environment. Next slide, please. Um, and we're seeing that in a couple of areas in particular. First is our work with Seagrass. Our Store Shores team has started working with Seagrass in the last couple of years. We have now built our second um, seagrass nursery. The first was, was down at the uh, Hub SeaWorld property, and that one is up and running. We have seagrass growing in those runways now. Seagrass that we are using not because we think that we're going to replant the entire Indian River Lagoon with that seagrass, but because it's allowing us to learn from that seagrass. Um, we know more about the seagrass that goes in, grows in the Balkans than we do the seagrass that grows right here in the Indian River. And so the research that we're able to put forward using the benefits of this campaign and the growth to everything that we do um, is going to play a vital role in the restoration efforts, both from the zoo, from the county, from all of our independent partners, from the city as well, um, long into the future at the Indian River Lagoon. Next slide, please. Um, our second big project that we've been working with more recently, um, you know, we've been working with oysters for a long time, we've been working with mangroves for a long time, but more recently seagrass and then certainly manatees. 
when we first launched this plan, manatees were not in the plans for the aquarium project. But after losing about 2,000 manatees in two years, we heard pretty loud and clear from our community that manatees needed to be in the plan. And so we're already working to step up our efforts to work with manatees. In the past year, we've assisted with over 31 rescues, 14 transports, 24 releases, and put in 2,000 hours of our staff time um, working with our partner organizations to help manatees. In addition to that, next slide please, we are um, soon going to be building our first rehab facility for manatees, um, again funded by FWC and funded by you know, the efforts of this campaign, uh, which will be at Brevard Zoo. This will be a sort of supportive care or acute care facility to allow us to take pressure off of our partner organizations when they have those critical care tanks that are filled. Um, and, pardon the pun, get our feet wet with manatee care for what will be coming at the new aquarium facility. Next slide, please. Because this is the big shiny object that we're talking about. This is what we're excited about, right? This is what's catching everybody's attention and for good reason. We've been sharing this picture for um, quite a few years now and when we share it, it's met with a lot of excitement, but it's also met with a big question and that is which part's the aquarium, right? Because when we look at this, we don't see a traditional aquarium within that picture, within that vendor. And that's because we're not building a traditional aquarium. I think if anybody knows Brevard Zoo, they know that we do things the Brevard Zoo way. We don't do things necessarily the traditional way. And so this is a Brevard Zoo aquarium. And so although plans shift and alter over time, in this original drawing, there's no manatees in there and we have changed plans. Um, but the concept remains the same. And what we are going to be building still maintains this indoor, outdoor, immersive experience um, that you see laid out in the rendering for you. Next uh, slide, please. Um, but this is a little bit more of an updated design drawing of what the site plan will look like. What you see highlighted in blue is what we have committed to including in our phase one opening plan. And so this is what we're moving forward with on construction documents currently. Um, and then the other colors are essentially funding dependent and then also um, providing us with some opportunity to add things into the future, to keep people coming back, to keep people excited about returning. But the vast majority included in our current phase one plans um, with one big exception. And the, the real big exception of what we've kind of the biggest change from these original plans we've shared is that centered grayed out area. And that is that big water play area. Um, and this was something that we had included in the original plans. We were excited about because it would give something different. But what we realized as we progressed with our plans is that that water play area was really not mission centric and not fully connected with who we are. Yes, our mission is to help wildlife and people thrive and a chance to play in the water and be active outside helps people thrive certainly. Um, but this area was so big that it really started to overshadow the mission of the rest of the facility. And so we're working on rethinking on what that central area looks like, um, but it also helps us reduce our water usage, come in line with the water needs um, of the site and of the port. Um, but really helps make sure that every aspect of this facility is going to be focused on our mission um, and connecting all of our guests, whether they're visiting from Cape Canaveral or Melbourne, Florida or Melbourne, Australia, with the local environment and taking those sort of universal lessons home with them on what we can all be doing to take better care of our waterways. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll go through just a couple of kind of updated renderings to show some of the progress that we're making, both with the theming and the planning of the specifics for these spaces. One of the first experiences that guests will encounter as they come through is going to be our new Sea Turtle Veterinary Hospital. So we have a fantastic sea turtle rehab program at Brevard Zoo. We have successfully rehabbed well over 200 sea turtles at this point, and that facility will be celebrating its 10th birthday that later this year. But this new facility will not replace our current sea turtle hospital. It will be a second location for us. So it will give us more capacity to help turtles. Um, and just as, or probably even more importantly, this will be built guest facing because our current hospital is built 20 years after the zoo opened. It's behind the scenes. Guests don't get to see it. Museums, zoos, aquariums, we've put a lot of money into figuring out how do we make people care enough to change our behaviors to help the environment. And what we've learned is that it requires empathy. And in order to get people to care enough to change their behaviors, we have to create empathy connections. And so experiences like the new sea turtle complex where guests will actually be able to come in through the space, visit with those turtles, see them in every step from the smallest intake pools where they're kept, where they can't physically, because they can't physically navigate a larger space, 
people to watch veterinary procedures, be able to watch them in these larger grow out space where they build strength. Every step of that journey of care is something our guests will get to follow along with. And that helps make that empathy connection and ensure that our guests are making that connection to the environment so that we can make those behavior changes to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our docs overview, one of the most amazing aspects of the site that we have is the fact that we are literally on the banks of the Banana River. We are connected to the water we are trying to connect our guests with and trying to get them to really, really fall in love with and learn to care about. And so being able to build these boardwalks out over the waterways allows us to put science into place and interpretation into place that connects them with what they're seeing directly in front of them. So under each of these kiosks, we'll be able to follow different themes. The one facing back towards the shoreline, we'll talk about mangroves and how mangroves are important for stabilization of our shorelines, preventing erosion, mitigating hurricane damage, but also the role that mangroves play in our fisheries and our economy as far as how our economy relies on fisheries, both recreational and commercial, and learning all of these things while looking at those mangroves directly in front of them. Next slide, please. Um, we continue to design work on our locks area, which is our kind of one big traditional aquarium experience where you're inside, you're in the dark, you're in the air conditioning, right? And you have that big wall of fish in front of you that some people are gonna be looking for when they hear the word aquarium. But we'll also be incorporating uh, more immersive, smaller spaces into that, even that large, more traditional space, like a soft play area for kids where they get to go down into the grass beds and into the seaweed and see a small habitat with seahorses and relate to how the seahorses are living within that field, of that field of grass and what it feels like to be that size in grass that is proportionate to the size of the kids. Again, trying to make these connections between our guests and our environment around us. Next slide, please. Um, but we also know that the Indian River Lagoon is not the only body of water that defines us here. Um, I think you know the, Cape, the city of Cape Canaveral knows it very well, you know, being the space between, right, you know, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian River. But then also we know that the St. John's also plays a very large role in our environment and our economy here as well. And so a portion of the facility will still be dedicated to the St. John's and some of the uh, in inhabitants there, including the American River Otter. Uh, next slide, please. And with our River Otter, Habitat, we are creating some really neat um, interactive experiences, one of which is an actual tunnel that people, you know, probably slightly shorter than myself and maybe a little bit more nimble, will be able to crawl down within and actually pass through the habitat of the otters, starting above water level, passing down, breaking through that water level, going all the way down through to give this, again, immersive experience. And we know how playful and curious American River otters are. And it's very, very likely that those otters, if they see an eight-year-old crawling through that tube, are gonna come over to explore. And the connection that that child will make and the memory that that will forge will then attach itself to the information they learn, the things that they learn as far as how they can help the environment around them. And those types of memories are the ones that last a lifetime. Next slide, please. Now, I started talking about manatees earlier and we are building manatee facility at the zoo, but that will be a supportive care facility. The true um, critical care manatee rehab for, for us will be at the aquarium space. And this is that space that will have those hydraulic braided floors where we can take the most critically injured or ill manatees, lift them to the surface to medicate and treat, control the depth of the water they have access to if they're not physically able to surface to breathe on their own, but then also give them access via these underwater tunnels, next slide please, to a larger, more natural looking space, next slide please. Um, that will actually be guest facing, just like with our sea turtles, because we want guests to connect with not only the work that goes into rehab for these animals, but more importantly, the animals themselves, so that as our guests return, especially from members, they're returning, they're seeing the progress that these individuals make, they're learning to connect with them as living, breathing, feeling creatures um, that have the same universal needs as we do, because when we make that connection, that's when we start to make the changes in our lives that can protect the world around us. Next slide, please. That's the beautiful picture that we're working towards, and that's where we are in our progress towards it. We could not be happier with the site, with the partnerships that we've created along the way, and with the progress that we're making. We're still planning on breaking ground this fall with a projected opening in 2027, um, and are so thankful for the opportunity to come out and talk to you all about it. Thank you so much. Any questions?
Thank you, Mr. Marchetti. Very nice presentation. And I know the public, I can speak on behalf of several residents, were inquiring about this. I think um, Chairperson uh, Ms. Don Mays had brought this up at a previous economic, uh, business and economic development board meeting and requested it. And you responded very quickly to that call. So thank you. Uh, Council, any questions this time? Is, and would these slides be available for the public? Yeah, we can make them available. Absolutely. Yeah, I can work through David and get you guys the, the renderings and the pictures. It's not a problem. Very much appreciated. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, the next is a presentation of Sierra Club Florida's Distinguished Osprey Award to Zachary Eichholz, our very own here at the City of Cape Canaveral Chief Resilience Manager by Turtle Coast Sierra Club Group Member Bill DeBusk. Bill, are you here? Please come forward. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Bill DeBusk. I'm the uh, chairperson for the local Pearl Coast Sierra Club. Um, our group represents the Sierra Club members that live in Bavard and Hinge River County. Uh, Sierra Club is the oldest environmental organization in the United States, and we have a mission uh, to help people enjoy, explore, and protect the environment. That's generically what we are. Um, this is the Osprey Award, and the Osprey Award is presented for extraordinary efforts by government staff, persons to promote or affect changes in policy or practice to protect or preserve Florida's environment. This is, it's a very distinguished award. Uh, it is given by the uh, Florida chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, most states in the United States have a single chapter, uh, represent, and they represent all, of, all the uh, Sierra Club members throughout the state of Florida. So it's given once a year uh, to a very special uh, person. And uh, this year, uh, we're giving it to uh, Zachary uh, Eicholtz. And you, you, you all know Zachary here, obviously, as a chief resilience manager, uh, graduated from Florida Institute of Technology back in uh, 2019. Today, he's in charge of the, the Community and Economic Development Department's Resilience Division here in uh, Cape Canaveral. And some of the uh, projects uh, that Zach has uh, helped with include, uh, he helped develop the City of Cape Canaveral Sustainability and Resilience Program, uh, known as uh, Cape Canaveral 2063. I believe that's when he turned 100 years old. Uh, he's also established and formalized uh, the City's Resilience Division in 2022. Uh, he established the City's Adopt a Mango Program, he established the City's uh, Tree Program, Adopt a Tree Program, Adopt a Rain Barrel Program, he helped establish, uh, uh, he led installation of the city's first uh, rooftop solar uh, array on the city of Cape Canaveral Community Center. He helped uh, implement numerous lighting protection throughout the city facilities. He helped oversee the city's disaster preparedness and recovery activities. Uh, he committed to installation of public uh, electric vehicle charging stations, supported the lead multiple shoreline Support, supported and led multiple shoreline plantings, uh, helped to facilitate the city of Cape Canaveral's acceptance to the LED for cities cohort, which helps uh, local cities and governments uh, set goals, collect data, validate performance, and become more sustainable, resilient, and prove uh, social equity. He also helped with um, the Florida Race to Zero campaign, uh, he's also worked with numerous academic partners to oversee the installation of seven remote sensor sites that help record real-time weather and climate data to improve the city's preparedness for um, weather events. He also assisted, or is currently assisting with the Veterans Memorial Park Smart Rain Guard. Uh, he oversaw installation of flood barriers and has helped to obtain multiple high-profile grants worth more than $2 million. So, Zach, and Zach also asked me to include this, and I think it's very important uh, <coughs> that he said none of these, none of these efforts uh, would have been possible if not for continuing support for our forward-thinking city commissioners. 
and the support of my fellow coworkers from each of the city's departments. This award is every bit their award and the city's overall award. Uh, nothing uh, that Zach has done would have been possible if not for the entire team's assistance, guidance, and willingness to innovate. Cape Canaveral is truly unique and is a place where anything is possible. So I'm very proud to, to present Zachary with this award. Zach, if y'all want to come forward, and thank you, team. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say uh, thanks again. I appreciate it. I don't know who to this day nominated me, but whoever it was, thank you. Uh, I, I really didn't expect it. I don't think I'm ever going to stop hearing bird calls down the hallway now. <laughs> <laughs> like an osprey. They have a funny call if you've ever heard one. But uh, I, I do want to impress upon the fact that it truly should be the city's award. Uh, I really wouldn't be here doing what we do without the city of Cape Canaveral, and I'm very grateful for the city and what they've done for me over the years. So it's uh, a great place to work. I truly come. In, I truly love coming in every single day, and uh, I think we're doing great things here. So let's just keep it up and keep going. Thank you. Yes, congratulations, Zach, and thank you for all that you do. Uh, I can tell you with a high level of confidence, the public appreciates you very much. Your attitude, resilience within your, your, uh, your own personality and the way that you respond to anything at any time. And uh, you are that steady hand on the wheel that so many cities do not have and very thankful we've invested in our city manager's leadership to work all the way down the line with the council, everyone in a, in a unified way as much as we can. So thank you and congratulations. Council, if there's anything I'd like to say. Congratulations again, Zach. Thank you for all you do. So Zach's not going too far because he, of course, knows the next agenda item. It's a presentation by Zach uh, on the city's new 2024 flood mitigation and adaptation strategy overview. Mr. Eicholz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, just got to keep working, you know. Um, my parents are here, so whatever I say to you, just nod and act like you think it's a good idea. <laughs> Them. Thank you. Um, I'm just kidding. So the, the 2024 flood mitigation uh, and adaptation strategy overview document is something we wanted to just show the council and the public by extension. It's a new document that was uh, made for the public. The city's resilience division met with uh, multiple departments to make this. The city has a lot of publicly available guides for how we do things, but we didn't have one that was specific to mitigation of flooding. Uh, and we wanted to get an all-encompassing document that showcases all of our, at least most of all of our uh, projects that we have going on at this time. So I'm going to take you through that document, kind of show you where it stems from and where it's going. So next, please. I just wanted to include the city's, the city's vision statement, uh, which was adopted, the new one was adopted by council last year. It's much smaller than the previous one, uh, but I think it reads really well. And we've bolded some of the standout items uh, that kind of help guide our program and tell us to do what we do. Uh, and the, the bottom one is essentially, or is uh, really important, future ready essential civic services and quality of life amenities. And that kind of dovetails into what I'm about to talk about next. Next, please. So the city of Cape Canaveral is definitely an up and coming place. It's emerging as a, as a regional socioeconomic hub at the intersection of South Central and Northern Florida. Um, as we have the space program revitalized with multiple private sector companies coming in and, and doing space operations, national security assets, and things like that. And of course, we have Port Canaveral, which is now 
I think Miami just took it back. As, so I think now they're the second largest cruise port by passenger volume in the world. I'm sure we'll get it back. Uh, you know, and by extension, we're developing new municipal services and infrastructure to be able to handle this growth, but also to reduce environmental impacts and create our own resilience as we can, being that we are a vulnerable barrier to island, susceptible to things like storm surge, erosion, heat, being that we're in the state of Florida. Next, please. And we are uh, vulnerable to flooding. As I'm sure most residents are aware, it's no secret that the city has drainage issues that we are working on uh, all the time. This is an example of uh, Fillmore Avenue flooding on September uh, 2022. Mayor, you actually took this photo. It's a, it's a good photo. Please be careful when you go out storm chasing. We definitely need you here. Um, <laughs> next, please. Uh, storm surge, very big issue. This is from Hurricane Nicole uh, from November of 2022. Uh, a lot of what you see here uh, did not, actually none of it made it past the primary dew line, which is great. Thanks in no small part to our annual sea oak plantings. This is exactly why we do this. You can see those small dunelets in the beach that had formed on their own naturally out by the water. Uh, not many of those made it past Hurricane Nicole, but we do believe that their presence helped to mitigate the wave energy from hitting the primary dew line to the west of it, which is essentially saving the beach. And not a lot of cities can say that their beach was okay after Hurricane Nicole, especially up in Volusia and Plasburg counties. Next, please. And then, of course, we have uh, flood concerns from the lagoon side. Uh, most of the cities, or all the cities, storm water outfalls go towards the lagoon, and when they become inundated, they we can lose pressure, uh, or pressure can be increased and not allow water to get out as fast. So these are just some of the things we're dealing with as a city we'll continue to deal with as we move into the future. Next, please. So in August of 2019, the City Council unanimously accepted the City's first ever vulnerability assessment in regards to flooding. This was done in conjunction with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, um, and it really showed the, the, the staff what, we, what some of our highest vulnerabilities as relate to storm surge, 100-year uh, flooding, 500-year flooding, um, and uh, coastal flooding, as well as long-term sea level rise. From there, those recommendations were taken and uh, city staff uh, built the, or wrote the Resilient Cape Canaveral Action Plan in 2021, which was unanimously accepted in June of that year by the city council. Within it were 56 preparedness targets, as we call them, grouped together in eight action categories. Next, please. Those eight action categories are, are shown here. Uh, all of the preparedness targets within them are essentially targets that the city can strive towards out to a measured date related to things like energy security, resilient economy, uh, making sure that waste is going to proper places. And then in the eighth one, the one that we're dealing with today, uh, storm readiness and sea rise. This is specific to obviously flood concerns. So we took this and basically said, hey, what are we doing as a city that is making sure the, the preparedness targets within this action category are being met? So next please. And here we have this document. So the 2024 Flood Mitigation Adaptation Strategy Overview document, definitely the longest resident guide we've ever written. It's about 50 pages long. Uh, it specifically highlights projects, programs, and initiatives for combating flood-related issues intended as an annually uh, updated uh, quick reference guide for residents, visitors, and council members. Uh, and it is a tool that we can also use for showcasing compliance with state-mandated flood policies or grant application readiness so that we can always say to somebody who uh, maybe a grant agency that we want to show, uh, hey, we have this plan, this is what we're doing, please help send some money our way. Some of the projects highlighted in this, I think there's 15 of them, and there's a map in the back that shows exactly where they are and labels them accordingly within the document. Remote sensor site network that we've deployed across the city, most of these have been donated to the city, thankfully, at no cost, which is awesome, and the data from these is publicly accessible on the city's website or uh, other adjacent partners' websites. These are constantly monitoring atmospheric data as well as water levels within the lagoon. Next, please. Another example is a very exciting project we currently have going on right now. If anybody is wondering what the construction is going on at Veterans Memorial Park, besides the park's overall enhancement, is this beautiful uh, construction of a what we're calling a smart rain garden that will increase stormwater capacity off Taylor Avenue uh, to the tune of 144,000 gallons. Uh, as well as be able to treat it before it goes into the lagoon, which is great. Um, this rain garden is also being called SMART. Next, please. Because uh, this rain garden will be able to tell us uh, data, unlike a lot of other installations of its kind, where we can showcase how much water is going into it, how many nutrients are being taken out before they go into the lagoon, as well as uh, local atmospheric data via installation of a new weather station by the library, which is also publicly accessible. 
This should be this should be completed by the end of the fiscal year. Next, please. Of course, we highlight the city's annual CO planting in this document. Shows you exactly how many plants we've planted every year since 2005. I'm pleased to say the planting event on Saturday went very well. We planted another 17,760 CO's beachside in about three hours, which is awesome. Uh, these plants are perennial grasses native to the southeast, and they do help protect the beach by growing very long root systems that help stabilize the sand dunes and also catch winds on the sand to positive and raise the overall height of the dunes over time. Next, please. And then, of course, it also highlights some previous projects that we've done, such as the underground stormwater chambers at Canaveral City Park, 4,000 linear chambers that can hold 931,000 gallons of stormwater. Uh, we can also put reclaimed water here from the water treatment plant once it's been treated. Uh, instead of tr putting it directly into the lagoon. Next, please. And that is it. This document is available right now on the city's website under its flood protection webpage. You can download it as a PDF. If anybody has any questions, they always feel free to reach out. It will be updated on an annual basis, so that way everybody knows what's going on every single year. As new projects come in, projects go out, they get completed. There's even conceptual projects in here that we can very long range at. Um, shows how they're funded, rationale behind them and so forth so it's very comprehensive and that's all i got for you wow thank you zach yeah. very valuable resource for the community and what's the fastest way for a resident or anyone to see the rain data on it through the city website there's Where a few different ways yes one of them is through the city's website there are um i believe we've listed every place you can go so there's uh two specific weather stations types two of which, one on this building and one at the water treatment plant are owned by the city, and that data is publicly accessible through the WeatherLink app, uh, or somebody can request the data via an Excel spreadsheet that, we can, that the device can spit out. We have sent it to business owners who are looking to upgrade their properties for flooding, and they they've used the data to be able to say, hey, this is how much we, we know we can get, so why don't we build for this kind of thing. And then the other ones are actually owned uh, that came free of charge from the Florida Atlantic University, through a network that they've developed across the southeast that literally consists of dozens of weather stations of the same type. That data is publicly accessible through their own web website, which we've listed on our website. So, Great. Um, anybody ever wants to see that data, just reach out and I can give you the link directly too. And it's accessible on the website, the latter. That's, thank you very much. Council, any more questions? Great job. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now coming up, last, certainly not least, our annual audited financial statements and independent auditor's report. For the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2023, we have a presentation by Mr. Michael Masano with James Moore & Co. Michael, thank you, and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Council. Um, yeah, this is basically just gonna be a high-level overview of the audit. Um, some of the key areas we wanted to highlight within the city's financial statements. Um, I did want to start by thanking John DeLay and his team. Um, the audit process is quite long and grueling. His team is always ready with all of our requests answered and any questions that come their way, they're quick to respond, uh, making the process go about as smoothly as it, it possibly can. So uh, thank you very much to John and his team. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so the first slide here is basically uh, the GFOA Certificate of Achievement that was awarded to the city. Um, in order to be awarded this achievement, various requirements have to be made, uh, have to be met. Uh, notable additional items that the city has to submit are a transmittal letter, expanded supplemental information in the statistical section, and you'll find all those items included with the ACFR this year. Um, so that's always a good uh, measurement of the city's uh, financial sophistication when they award that that certificate. So uh, next. Um, so this slide is basically going to highlight the various audit reports that you'll find within the ACFR. Um, the first one, uh, the main audit report on page 20 to 22, um, you'll see that we did uh, issue an unmodified opinion, which is the best possible opinion that we can issue, uh, essentially signifying a clean audit. So um, great work for the city there. Uh, the single audit report on pages 108 to 110, uh, you'll note this, the city did have a state single audit this year. Um, in which no issues of non-compliance were noted. Um, next, you'll find the internal control and compliance report 
on pages 111 to 112, um, there was noted to be no internal control or compliance matters reported. Um, chapter 10.550, the Auditor General Report. Um, we did have two other recommendations that were discussed with management and the council. Um, these adjustments are expected to be made in, in the years coming forward, so all good there on those recommendations. Um, and then finally, the Independent Accountants Examination Report on page 116. Um, we did note that the city is in compliance with all specified investment statutes. So across the board, all good there. Um, the next slide uh, is basically going to be the breakdown of the general fund, different fund balance categories. Um, basically, you're just looking here in total. Um, the city was slightly lower than last year, and that's a result of the ARPA funds of about $1.5 million that were expended uh, during 2023. Um, and that's actually going to lead into the next slide. Um, so on this slide, you'll see uh, basically the city's reserves um, and the GFOA minimum recommendation um, for the reserve amount, which is approximately two months or 16.7%. Um, you'll see that the city was at 33.2%, which is approximately four months um, of reserves. And the way that's calculated is, is a combination of assigned and unassigned fund balance from the prior table um, of about 5.4 million. Um, so above the, the minimum requirement. And it's also worth noting that um, if you were to exclude the assigned fund balance, so basically just the unassigned um, undesignated funds, the city is closer to about 20 to 22 percent, um, which is still above the minimum requirement. Um, and for coastal communities, um, we see that as a healthy range just for the risk of natural disasters from hurricanes or, or flooding. Um, the next slide is going to be detailing the enterprise funds. Um, and here, basically, what you're looking at for wastewater and stormwater is, is just the upward trend of net position. So you'll see over the last four years, net position is trending upward um, in a positive way for both wastewater and stormwater, which is positive and, and good to see there. So all good from that table perspective. Um, and the next slide, so this is kind of our catch-all slide with some of our other highlights, other items that we want to note within the ACFR. Um, starting with the CRA, so a separate audit is issued for the CRA and there was noted to be no findings and no issues um, from that audit. Um, it was noted that revenue exceeded $2 million for the first time in the CRA, which is nice to see a new, a new threshold achieved. Um, and then also there was a 203,000, approximately 203,000 deficit in fund balance of the CRA, um, which is expected to be recovered by future revenues. Um, from the ARPA funds standpoint, um, about 3.8 million remaining in committed fund balance, which you'll see included in the general fund in that table that we showed previously. And then finally, uh, debt. Um, just some areas to highlight here, uh, about 960,000 in wastewater SRF loan drawdowns in the current year. Um, it is worth noting that all of those loan drawdowns are at 0%, so 0% interest rates. Um, so essentially free money from that standpoint. Um, next bullet point, about 1.8 million in total current year debt principal repayments, um, split amongst governmental and wastewater, 1.3 million and 485,000. And then finally worth noting that amongst all the city's debt allegations, um, interest rates range from zero to 2.05%. So extremely low interest rates. Um, we consider all that debt to be good debt and extremely healthy based on the, the interest obligations. So um, that covers that on the next slide. Um, any questions related to the audit? No, Michael, very nice job. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, council, any questions? Comments? Thank Mayor, can I make a suggestion? Yes, please. Make a comment? Um, yeah, just an extraordinary job by the finance department and, all, and also all the staff who supported, you know, uh, the day-to-day -day operations and what have you. But I, um, in addition, though, I want to make uh, recognition to my deputy finance director, uh, uh, Jenny Coldiron. She'll be headed to Kentucky to assume a finance director position with an organization in Kentucky. Very, very proud of her. I, I think it, she'll be thoroughly missed, but we'll bring on, we'll bring on a new person and uh, you know, continue to give the great performance. But I will tell you that uh, Jenny put her whole heart and soul into this city. And um, you can see I get a little emotional, but I really appreciate people 
who come in and just really care about what they're doing. And that's what she did. So we're all better for it. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time and, and yes, um, thank you also for the one-on-ones to, to help us understand. For anyone who'd like to see the city of Cape Canaveral uh, report of compliance audited financials here, you have to love that cover. A beautiful peacock, uh, shout out to uh, all who are involved, but uh, there's copies here. These are available online, and uh, if you ever have any questions, they're very helpful and, and with the responses. So you and Zach, thank you very much and the entire firm for all your hard work. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes the uh, presentations, interviews portion of the meeting. We are it's right on time, I guess, 645. Uh, and now we are into the public participation portion of the meeting. If I do have a few cards up here. Um, if any of you would like to speak, uh, please. Is that ringing when I speak? Oh, sorry. Um, if you'd like to speak, please fill out a card provided at the front and provide it here to our sergeant in arms and uh, we'll make sure you have uh, time to be heard. The uh, timer here, the right in front of me, green light goes on three minutes and uh, about 30 seconds prior, we just ask that you, you wrap it up and that's when the yellow light comes on. And um, if you get to the end and you need uh, to, to just finish a few sentences, that's fine, but we do appreciate uh, your willingness to come forward and share. So tonight, uh, the uh, also folks who are listening at home, um, if you would like to be heard, uh, we ask that you please raise your hand. Uh, I will recognize you after those who, have, who are here with us today have a chance to speak. Um, unmute you in the same rules for three minutes. And so for those of you who are listening at home, please, uh, if you intend to speak, go ahead and raise your hand and uh, we'll make sure uh, to unmute you when that time comes here. So the first card I have here is Mr. John Benton. Next one is Michelle Height, Mr. Benton. Yes, sir, I don't know, uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Hey, Wes, why did you why did you sign a trespass order on me for holding a sign that the judge Crawford asked me to bring here because you guys caused the problems? None of these other board members signed it. They're the only ones left. You trespassed me, man. For calling out Kevin Mann, a deacon in the Presbyterian Church, for coming into a code enforcement hearing, hearing lying to you guys and the city and the police department for months that I live in a warehouse. And you guys know that I have a cop in the unit next to my warehouse and he was up there as much as me. And Kevin's son, Kevin Mann, the deacon in the Presbyterian Church, his son was using the warehouses next door that you can't live in as his residential site where he lived. He got arrested for that. He's in there testifying. I don't have anybody living in the warehouse. His son's living in the one next door. There's six people in those warehouses the night he testified. I brought pictures into the board. I spent 60 bucks to come in and prove to you guys who Kevin was. I did not know he was a deacon in the church the night he testified against me. I didn't know his son was a sex offender. And you didn't know that until now, and the FBI got involved, that I was coming out on the Jew school while I was in that warehouse. I called it a private school, but when I found out that the mayor and the lawyer and the lawyer that night and, and everybody is Jewish, and I'm coming out on a Jew school because psychologists said, John, you need to tell somebody. So I told Judge Rainwater. And six months later, you guys are laughing at me because you think I'm homeless living in the warehouse. No, I'm in there reliving what happened to my daughter because Howard Servolo and a lawyer on Merritt Island said, I can't do anything about it because the statutes of limitations are up. I said, I said, crazy, I will do something about it. Doesn't involve Kevin. He shouldn't be in there telling. 
He lied to you guys, man, for months. He's a pedophile groomer. When his son is using that warehouse, he's helping his son break that law. And you trespassed it. You said I was undesirable. What about Kevin's son? Is he desirable? You want to keep him here, a pedophile? His father? Think about it, man. He's grooming children here. You want him grooming your children? You'll find out in 10 years, oh, he, something happened. You got anything to say? If you don't have anything to say, I'm going to be over there with, with the attorney's name on a sign that says, Paul and Kim Coffin, this lawyer over here, because it's him, racist Jews. Not paid Jews, no. just racist Jews. I'm not racist until you did this to me. Okay. Thank you. Time's up. I still got a yellow light there, man. Isn't it? Slanderous, See, slanderous remarks are not ones that we are trying to have and or facilitating. Okay, the next one here on the agenda is Miss Michelle Height. Michelle, hello, how are you? your help in restoring our little piece of paradise. Uh, I'm here today to say to everyone that a lot of actions have taken place since our last city council meeting. Um, starting with, I was invited to a meeting with the city manager and the attorney and uh, the staff uh, to review the current DBA requirements with ASI. And uh, since that meeting, um, the community has seen a significant improvement in uh, the current issues. So uh, we're very thankful for the effort that has been made in the following areas. Uh, reducing the nighttime work hours, clearing all the debris from behind the fence, and uh, so importantly, uh, moving the pile, the, uh, the aggregate pile, away from the BRB area north toward the King uh, George King Highway. So uh, even today, the president of ASI called me with an update and uh, mentioned that they had bought a new water truck. And he believes that that will help with the dust mitigation in our community. So um, I have continued to provide updates to the community uh, that I live in. And uh, they understand that our request for um, restoring the natural landscape and barriers and fencing uh, will be considered in conjunction with uh, the new proposed DBA permits. And uh, we will work with Dave Dickey for those updates. So um, basically I'm here to say uh, thank you to the City Council for listening to our concerns and providing quick responses and guidelines to move forward. Um, additionally, I would like to thank all of the community members that have stopped by Portside Villas and uh, reached out to me directly uh, to offer their support and advice and ideas on how to tackle this overwhelming issue that we have in our community. Um, all the feedback is so appreciated and more importantly, um, that help has made our community feel supported and uh, you know, we just, we really appreciate that. Um, Last city council meeting, it was a different story, right? Um, so with all that said, um, we are sincerely hopeful that one day soon our little paradise will be restored. And uh, we're going to remain positive. <laughs> Thank you. Please finish. When, yes. Thank you, Michelle. That is very encouraging. Thank you for the update and continued help. Mr. Ray Zawacki. Yes, my name is Ray Zawacki and I'm a proud resident of Portside Villas. 
And I am here tonight because I was here in November and I was here in December just about on bended knee begging for some help with our problem that Michelle just addressed. And uh, we, uh, to, I couldn't have written a better lesson plan. I was a, I'm a former teacher uh, to have uh, people who are here today who are so engrossed in the environment, protecting the environment, uh, growing the environment, defending ourselves against the environment, all these special things that are environmentally uh, sane and that we all need to take to seriously to heart. And I see that with what Michelle has said and with your actions on our behalf, that you are indeed uh, supportive of that environment because we have, we have, let's call it a smudge right now in Cape Canaveral and, and you're, you're doing things to help get rid of that smudge. And I, I don't wanna take, take away any of thunder that, that Michelle had, but I, I really respect what she has done with, uh, in communication with the, the council and, and the committee to get things done. And as a citizen of Cape Canaveral and as a proud um, resident of Portside Villas, I wanna ex personally express my gratitude to you and encourage you to continue to make sure that this is carried out through for, to for fruition, excuse me, to fruition so that we can all enjoy a safe, clean, healthy, uh, growing environment. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Zawacki. We appreciate as the same that's, that's the wacky that's um, so wacky I'm not, I'm not irish okay. so really it's called zavatsky and holy zavatsky <laughs> thank you miss bonnie cocker hi bonnie thank you for being here come on forward i have a report that uh, as well tonight. Thank you. Re re directly related at the end, but I'm very happy that you're here. This is perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mark. Morrison and Council. My name is Bonnie Cocker, and I am a representative representing the HOA of Ten Pebbles Condominium at 504 Kenmore Street. Um, and I bring two concerns forward this evening. Uh, our first our first concern is seeking, we are, we are seeking approval to trim the speed grates on the beach side of the front of the condominium to the three and a half foot um, minimum level uh, allowed by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, we feel that make the front of our condominium in compliance with many of the other condominiums who are off located on the beach and would also improve the um, ocean view in several of our condominium units that are direct ocean view. Um, to that end, we have spoken with Jason Spaniard of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection who is supportive of our request to do this. We need no permit, permit to be able to do this, provided that there are no objections by local, state, or federal agencies to this land use action. We can hopefully get your support on that. Um, and thank you. Uh, secondly, we are requesting that the speed rates to the south of the boardwalk at the end of the ramp, between the boardwalk and the uh, wind down the condominium, be trimmed to also be trimmed to the three and a half foot minimum level and that the several palm trees that have grown up in the midst of these speed grates um, be removed. Uh, not only will this right now that area Right now that area is really a dog scratch of um, 
great that are on various levels, that the concrete are obstructing views from down the street and so on, and um, from various units within our condominium. And we would like to restore the, um, the ocean view there. Ms. Scott, do you need some more time? I don't, if you, another minute, council, good? Please. Thank you. I had a chance to uh, meet with Bonnie over a year ago, I believe, in the photographs and the things, and actually take a look at the view. And many uh, months passed by and followed up, and she had uh, requested that we discuss this at the council meeting. So it's my intentions during the reports tonight, if uh, we could consider and, and uh, talk about the procedures that uh, they would need to follow, if any at all. Um, do you have any more comments on that? I just want to emphasize that I, I do intend to circle back to that tonight. If thank you. The next one is Miss Tina Freeman. Hi, Tina. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for the service that you do. You don't get paid nearly enough <laughs> for what you have to deal with. Um, but also, too, um, I want to say thank you for finally addressing the Pedway. We started asking for this. We sent letters starting in 2021 um, asking for uh, the Pedway to be marked um, because we were getting run over by electric bicycles on the sidewalks. And we've noticed since you have done this and addressed this um, just recently, we've already seen a significant number of bicyclists not riding on the sidewalk, um, which has been very helpful. However, we're still having some issues and um, stopping and asking the bicyclists, um, they are telling us that the places where they are renting these electric bicycles are telling them that they can ride on the sidewalks. So we're asking if there's some way the city could send letters to um, these places, A1A bike rentals, um, Ron John Surf Shop, Cocoa Beach um, Surf Shop, these places that are renting these electric bicycles, if you could send a letter to them and let them know we have a marked pedway for these electric bikes that are you know, zooming 30, 40 miles an hour and running us down um, on the sidewalks. So if that could be addressed, we'd really appreciate it. And secondly, if maybe we could have some signage down at the beginning where Cocoa Beach and then um, the unincorporated area um, meets the city of Cape Canaveral, if we could have a signage down there. I know at one point, the Brevard County Sheriff's Department, they definitely, they put an electronic sign down there that lasted for about a month, letting um, riders know not to ride on the sidewalk, that to use the bike path. So if we could address that, and then lastly, the third issue that came up was the bicyclists were concerned because they thought the pedway is only one direction because all the um, markings are going from um, north to south, but there's nothing going south to north, so they think it's one way. <laughs> so that led to a lot of confusion. So if we could address those couple of things, it would be perfect. <laughs> and then um, next, the other thing I had to bring up was um, – the, um, oh, well, the cutting the sea grapes, we'll talk about that. Um, but lastly is, um, oh, the right whale program. So Kay, Councilman Kay Jackson, introduced us to the um, Blue World Research Institute. And um, the woman who's in charge of that, her name is Julie, and she's actually located just off of Panita Causeway. And so um, she is um, heading up this program to protect our right whales. And... Um, we're, wa we're wanting to do a presentation and things like that. So Kay has put us in touch with Zach, 
Need can another I, minute? Can I have one more minute? Yeah, yeah. Please. So Kay, um, as Councilman Kay Jackson has put us in touch with Zach, and then Zach is going to work with us um, to put together a workshop for white whale spotting and um, just informing and educating the citizens here about the white whales and the fact that they need protection. And we want to educate the recreational boaters um, and, and also the first responders too um, as well because I'm, I think that they get some calls too like what is that in the water, that big thing we're seeing. And so um, we just had a recent um, sighting of a mama and a calf heading down from Jacksonville. So they're on their way down. They're farther out, but we just had some really bad news in that we had a one-year-old. Once they're, once they're one years old, they are separated from their mothers. And basically our Canaveral National Seashore is their nursery. And so the mothers and the calves, we've seen them come down. And so this particular one-year-old, last year we um, spotted in we all, it was tagged and everything, and it was with its mother last year. Well, this year it was on its own, one year old, and it was traveling south, and somewhere between the port and Satellite Beach, it got hit by a recreational vehicle, a recreational boat, and by the time it got to Melbourne Beach, it died. So that just happened two weekends ago. So that was devastating to us. So, and then regarding the um, sea grapes cutting, um, we'd like to get everybody on the same page as far as the um, sheriff's department, code enforcement, and everybody on the same page. We've had a couple of instances where sheriff's deputies have been called out to Sand Pebbles, and the sheriff's deputies were told, told the landscapers, stop what you're doing, put down your um, tools. Even though we've been in compliance, and um, Brian Palmer can tell you we've been in compliance every mm -hmm. year for years um, as far as the cutting of the sea grapes. And so we want to make sure we get the deputies, the code enforcement, everybody on the same page as far as cutting of the sea grapes to what um, length they can be cut. And so I have pictures of at least a half a dozen um, condominiums where they are compliant. They're cutting them down to 42 to 48 inches. They're all compliant. And also to the three agencies that are in charge of the dunes protection and I have their information and their rules also. Thank you. So I can provide you with a copy of that. If you want to provide it here to our Sergeant in Arms, he'll make sure that okay. we, we get it, but please okay. just do. Thank Great. you. Well, thank you very much for your time and all your efforts. Thank you, Tina, for all of your work on the right will. Okay, thank you, yes. Thank you, Kate, for introducing us to this program. <laughs> it's gonna be great. Thank you, okay. That is all I have for uh, physical cards, uh, unless I missed you. If so, I ask that you please raise your hand. We'll make sure you have a chance to speak. And anyone at home who would like? Just going to double check. Oh, it looks like, OK. And with that, seeing I do see a hand raised, yeah, Mr. Arlen DeBlau, please come forward, sir. Thank you. I just want to say I've been a right whale watcher since uh, 2011. And she talked about Julie. Yes, she's very knowledgeable on what's going on and so forth and what has been happening. And I know we've lost a couple already this year. We're down to less than 340. Uh, right whales on the East Coast. Wow. Just want to add that, but I appreciate what she said. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember just talking to you about it, and you answered my. I said, "Who was I talking to about that the other day?" It was you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to recognize Arlen De Blau for another year of perfect attendance at the TPO as a citizen advocate, and really appreciate all your work on that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Cape Canaveral showed up strong. Thank you both very much. Appreciate that. And uh, that sort of coincides with, I think, some of the public comments we're hearing on the pedways and the improvements. Um, so, okay. 
We are now done. No more hands. I see none. Go ahead and close public participation uh, here. And actually, I, I do want to just check one thing. Is uh, Dr. Elena Saul, if you would like, because um, I know time is important, to wait to the end, or if you wanted three minutes to at least for whatever reason you could speak to any of it. Thank you. Okay, coming back now to the consent agenda. It's 7, 11 p.m. Council, everyone doing okay? City staff, doing good city manager. Consent agenda item. Uh, any of these we'd like to pull, please let us know. Uh, just wanna point out for the public, item number one, is approving two sets of minutes, one for the January 16th, 2024 regular meeting and one for the January 2024 special meeting. Um, city attorney, just deterred. I mean, approving both of those minutes at once, should that be two separate votes or is that okay to bundle? I, totally, thank you. That's we, great. We frequently do. Thank you for the reminder. Just the uh, accepting the audited financial statements number two, the Mead and Hunt, uh, fifty-eight thousand four hundred fifty-nine dollars for the construction and uh, phase engineering services, and uh, this is for the Center Street pump station, which is uh, related to some flooding issues. That's number three. Number four is they approve the new backhoe in the amount of $85,700 and authorized city manager. We have a large backhoe, I think it's being serviced, got, um, and this is to buy a second as a backup smaller version, and number five is to approve and provide possible dates for a workshop meeting. Oh no, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, four or five, I rolled over. So those four items, thank you for letting me uh, communicate those to the public. Pull any, council? If not, looking for a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. We got a motion by council member Willis and a second by council member Davis to approve the consent agenda items one through four. City, any other discussion? Council, city clerk? Council member Davis? Four. Council member Jackson? Four. Mayor Pro Tem Kellum? Four. Mayor Morrison? Four. Council member Willis? Four. Now it brings us on to item for action, item number five, which is to approve and provide possible dates for a city council joint educational workshop meeting with the planning and zoning board regarding green stormwater infrastructure and low impact development codes and program incentives. Uh, council, if it's okay, I'd like to toss this over to our city manager and thank you very much, Todd. Absolutely, and Lexi's having a seat here because she'll be at a little, able to add more commentary than I will. Uh, essentially, when we adopted our resiliency action plan, we, as Zach said earlier tonight, we put in there several preparedness targets that we want to hit. Uh, some of those preparedness targets talk about specifically putting codes in place in the city code. Um, and, and Lexi can talk to those specific preparedness targets, but they're, what we have been doing in our projects is voluntary when it comes to the above and beyond code requirements, for example, the green stormwater initiatives, um, the low impact development like you saw at Veterans Memorial Park. We're doing that voluntarily, plus we're also pursuing grants to get that done too, but we're, we've been leading by examples to get this done. These preparedness targets talk about putting codes in place that require private investment to do it as well. Um, and the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council combined with Stetson University, who've worked with staff for many years and very successfully, want to help us with this initiative. But in order to get there, they want to have a joint meeting with the city council and the planning and zoning board together in the same meeting room at the same time, because these are the, the decision makers, right? Who the planning and zoning board choose on the codes, make recommendations. City council is the one that would ultimately approve those recommendations. To talk about specific, in this workshop, specific um, lessons learned in other cities, practices that other cities are currently doing, but get, get the city council's sentiment and the planning and zoning board's sentiment for how does it work in Cape Canaveral? This is kind of a groundbreaking thing, bringing in codes that are new to support 
a very vulnerable nature uh, uh, that we, we, are, we recognize in our resiliency action plan, but making concrete changes by changing the rule book to say, you really have to build this way in Cape Canaveral because it's about our long-term um, survivability as a city and doing things smartly. So this, this workshop is the, perhaps the first of a few workshops, but kick it off, get the city councils and planning zoning board sentiment and how you feel about putting these codes in place. And then they'll go away from that and put together a document that says, okay, based on what we heard, these are the codes that would work well in the city of Cape Canaveral. Many months, maybe a year or more into this before we see the deliverables, but in, in essence, that's what it is. And Lexi, did I cover it fairly okay? What can you add to that? Um, that's, that covers about everything. The only additional context is this is a deliverable that comes out of the um, NSF Civic Innovation Grant that is being used to fund the Veterans Memorial Park Smart Rain Garden um, project. So that's one of, the, one of the measures of success for that project from the granting agency includes transferability of the project as well as scalability. Uh, and so on a physical plane, scalability means can other people do this? Can they replicate it? Um, and on a kind of a, a more policy plane, that's, you know, what can we learn from this in a way that can um, inform and guide our decisions in the future? Uh, and so that, that's part of that, that deliverable for that, for that grant that we received from NSF for this project. So there is a target date range for council to pick um, three dates. Um, what is that range, Lexi? Yes, so initially we had put the date range of March 11th to the 29th into the um, agenda cover. However, there have been some um, scheduling conflicts that have come to light since we put this together and tonight. Uh, so we are asking council to take a look for three dates between actually March 25th and April 15th in the evening. This could coincide with a regular PNZ meeting if we needed to or during what, what could be a regularly scheduled PNZ meeting as well. And kind of the process that we'll be following is we'll get three dates that work for you all. We'll take that back to PNZ via email, you know, with a, you know, do not reply all attached to it, get their availability for those three dates and then pick the date that works best. Uh, and that's just to kind of try and get everybody on the same page. We think it's really important to get as many of our board and our council members together to learn about it all at once so that it's a little bit more effective use of everybody's time. Um, and that way, you know, if there are any questions that can be posed, it can be posed all together and addressed by our, by our partners and then brought back, you know, at future workshop dates. So if the council is so inclined, Mayor, um, the council could suggest three dates within that range and then Staff would take it back to P and Z, figure out which of those dates were, works best, and then communicate that date, set it all up for that date. Mayor. Thank you, thank you both, Lexi and Todd. Council. When, when did you say the P and Z board meeting is? The P and Z board meetings are on the second and fourth. Wednesdays. Two, Wednesdays of every month. So that would be March 27th. Would that would be either March 27th or the second one in that date range would fall on April 10th. So we could coincide with that, but we're not going to hold to that if need be. If two of, if we want to choose, if availability suits those dates from you all, then by all means, those can be um, considered. But it, it wouldn't ne be necessarily wouldn't have to adhere to those if need be. We can we can. That's why choosing more than one um, was kind of our strategy for this. Councilmember Willis. What would be the uh, time commitment? Likely an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, it would be a little bit more high level, very much educational. Um, again, kind of going over what other cities and communities have done, lessons learned, uh, what exactly it means to implement this type of code. So it would be, it would be high level um, view of it. Uh, so probably an hour to an hour and a half, a typical workshop length. To be safe, let's call it two hours. To be safe, let's call it two hours. Would that be the only thing on the P and Z agenda that night? If, we if it would be the workshop, it would it would replace that meeting. Yes. Councilmember Willis. Um, well, I'd, if if it was going to replace the P and Z meeting, you know, I was going to suggest doing it on the 28th since they were already going to be here, but if that doesn't matter. The 27th? Or of March. 
March 27th. March 27th. That works for me. Wednesday, March 27th, two hour time slot. What time? Six to eight. Six, six yeah. to eight. Okay. We've moved the strategic planning, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a CIP workshop. Um, yeah, it's not in March. It's in April. Yeah, I forget the date. April 2nd? Yeah, Second. That's my golf day. <laughs> as long as it's not your birthday. <laughs> I quit having those. If I could maybe make a recommendation, perhaps we can look at March 27th, April 10th, and April 11th as a backup. That way, two of the dates are on regularly scheduled. Um, well, if obviously we'd have to get quorum from PNZ, but two of those dates would be during a normal PNZ meeting, and then we have kind of a uh, a curveball if need be, if there's a little bit too much that needs to go to PNZ during a normal meeting, or if or if we can't get quorum for some reason. Does, does, it, does April 11th work for the council? It, Twenty be on vacation that day. Uh, your March 27th. April 10th and April 11th? Yes, but it sounds like Council Member Kellum won't, or Mayor Pro Tem Kellum won't be available. No. What about uh, the day before April 9th? Um, oh, no, I'm hoping to be away that week. That week, okay. Yeah. That's helpful to know big blocks. Uh, so th the, is the goal to try and determine the date tonight or at least try to get a general idea and then you'll like, you explained. Yeah, the goal is to have just three dates that you all are available tonight that we can then take back to PNZ for their availability. And currently we have consensus on March 27th as one of those options. It, it's fine with me. Uh, but that and then we have a March or an April 10th and 11th that I think could, or 9th, 10th, and 11th is not a good fit for Mayor Pro Tem. What if we did included the first week of April? I th okay, so you, uh, Lexi, you, did you? Yeah, the, 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 so the initial date that we had, the initial date range we had looked at was on the agenda cover, but we did have to change it just because we had some um, updates to other schedules at that time. So we were looking from March 25th to April 15th. I just kind of shifted it. Uh, but if we'd like to look at the rest of the week of the 15th, we can look at that as well. That would be the same week as a council meeting. So obviously the 16th would be out of the question. Um. It's going to be really hard. What I can say is if we can reasonably space them out, I think I'll find one and, and figure out a way to make it work. On my, I can speak for myself. But it, it would be... That first week of April? Yes, what about April 3rd? Wednesday? The third. Uh, yes, I think that could work for me. Um, nothing's jumping out. That Is that could that be a good second option? Yeah, I'm, I can I can make that entire week open if I need to. Okay. What's next? Look, I think we're good with that one. Do you yes, need one so more? March 27, April 3rd, and then I know it's the same week as a council meeting, um, but what, April 18th? 18th or 17th? 17th or 18th. Yeah, either one of those do work for me, too. Uh, I'm fine. The 18th is not good for me, but the 17th could work. I'm good. Is that okay? 17th. It'll just be an extra fun week. Yeah, the 15th's my anniversary, so there's not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the three dates that were thrown out that seem to be um, accommodatable for the council are March 27th, which is a Wednesday, April 3rd, which is a Wednesday, and April 17th, which is a Wednesday.
Do we need to hear those anymore? Everyone hear them? No, I think we're good. Okay, yes. we'll record consensus on those dates. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, Thank you, Lexi. You. Now my wife has heard over Zoom that I haven't forgotten our anniversary. No. <laughs> <laughs> on the record. Okay, great. Thank you both. Yep. We are on to the city manager. Anything else there That's with that item? Thank you. Uh, item number seven. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, got my, my agenda turned around here. Uh, we are moving to items for discussion. If we don't mind, I would propose we're 730 to take a 10 minute re break and we can come back and get into the discussion. Uh, it's 726, maybe try to get back by 740 and latest. If we're all here earlier, we can start. Ken, thank you.
Okay, we'll get started here in about a minute. Thank you all. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you. Call the meeting back to order. It is 7.41 p.m. We are at the items for discussion portion of the meeting. And we are at item number six, which is discuss criteria for special meetings workshops submitted by Council Member Davis. Councilmember Davis, the floor is yours. Oh, it's working. Oh, there it is. Okay, um, it, it just appears that, that we're going to be calling a lot more workshops or special meetings. So during this time, I've found that it it seems that we when we are calling special meetings or workshops, it appears that it has to be done like within the next couple of days. So I want us to determine or discuss what we feel is urgent or not urgent and when we should have the meetings. Because an emergency, if it's emergency situation, it needs to be called immediately or, um, you know, it's extraordinary circumstances. So I just want to discuss um, the time frame and the meetings to be called. I don't want to go into all the detail, but when, um, when we call them, what's the criteria? When are we going to have, what time are we going to have them? And, uh, what action we're going to have uh, because what I guess what I'm saying is the meetings that we've been called have been called are being called in a short time and a time frame that gives the council less time to get prepared for the meetings it gives staff less time to get prepared for meetings and we just need um, adequate time to you know to be prepared and I believe in calling the meetings um, should be considerate to the staff and to the other council, and I'm going to ask that uh, all the meetings be called at 4 p.m. or after on a special meeting, unless it's deemed urgent or, you know, an emergency. Um, I've stated on the record twice that it is a hardship for me to get here prior to 4 p.m., yet the last two workshops or special meetings that we have had have been called prior to uh, 4 o'clock, and I, I just feel that that's being inconsiderate due to the hardship, unless it is urgent matter. Um, so I would like to discuss when we deem it's an appropriate for a special meeting, when we deem it's urgent, and what's the time frame that we will be calling the meeting. And, uh, I, and I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gwendolyn. And uh, discussion item, council, anyone? So like when we call a special meeting, how soon would you like to have that meeting held if it's not urgent, urgent? Because we've been doing it in the past, you know, in a few days when there's been conflicts with board meetings, been conflicts with people's schedule, different things. So how urgent or how quick do we think a special meeting, meeting needs to be called? Well, I think I called the most recent special meeting. Oh, and we've had two. Well, we had the... No, we had a workshop. I think the most recent oh, um, special meeting was... We approved the minutes to that one tonight. Let's use that one as an example. Yeah, we should. In but in, in the word, or, you know, consideration, I think, was used, or in consideration. Here's what I considered. I went to the ordinance, and it clearly lays out the criteria that we discussed and need to follow, and it says that consider the action items no later than 48, hour, 48 hours from the date that the notice was provided and goes through those procedures. I uh, followed those procedures. Um, I know that our staff today was a part of helping shape that. 
the ordinance is alive and well, and uh, if it needs improving, I think that that's the place that we need to, to work. I think this was recommended um, by some of our staff members, and it was, I think, unanimously supported. And so um, that, that's what I used as a guideline to schedule that special meeting, um, Section 257, Special and Emergency Meetings. Um, the, as far as the time frame that I think you said you stated twice on the record, uh, I, if you were to ask me, it, in my head it was 1 p.m. I remember you saying it, and I'm agreeing with you, I remember you saying 1. However, I could not, I wasn't certain, and when I sent the email out, what I considered was giving enough option within my request that would allow the most flexibility for all council. Knowing your criteria, or, or 4 p.m., that's very helpful. Um, I don't think, I don't know if the ordinance is the place we want to address that, but um, moving forward, I hear you loud and clear on 4 p.m. Yes. From, my, from my request. And yes, hopefully that's helpful on, on what I went through. Not a lot of special meetings have been called by council in, well, in, since I've served. Uh, special meeting workshops. Yeah, and workshops are a little different. I mean, the hurdles I had to jump over to get a special meeting were higher than a workshop. I had to have a specific uh -huh. action that was needed to be taken. And that agenda item it sort of did my best to follow it. And uh, yeah, the workshops, I think that was the most recent meeting we had with, I think Council Member Jackson requested that. And I can speak to that one if you'd like. Uh, counts absolutely um, so when I scheduled the the workshop uh, mayor Morrison in our January meeting had said move it to our February meeting however it was going to take too much time and staff sent me the the sheet to fill out for that agenda item along with resolution 2022 28 on efficient meetings that the count prior councils had adopted so I knew clearly it was not going to fit in that in this meeting tonight. So I looked at whether I should have a special meeting or a workshop. I worked with the city clerk and the city manager. I asked them to come and worked with them, trying to get them in with their schedules. Um, Zach had several meetings, and some of them that he was working on were the bioswell, which I think is an important project because it's gonna hold water when we have flooding issues. So the thing with the workshop, you don't have to have anyone there and we were coming to a consensus on the reports that we need to look at as a council from the new EV charging stations. And so I said it along, you know, working with uh, the city manager and the city clerk. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not here to argue with anybody. I'm just here to determine when we're going to do it in the time frame to be considerate of others. I was aware that you knew out of a, a city manager meeting that I'm, excuse me, a meeting that I had with the city manager and you chose to do it anyway. That's again, I'm not accusing. I'm not saying anything. I just want it understood or where we're coming from or everybody's coming from because it does cause a hardship if they do it before four o'clock. It does cause me to have to get off work early and I don't get paid for it. If it's an emergency situation, I have no issue being here. But other than that, I would ask that everyone be somewhat considerate and uh, uh, you know, under the understanding, I'm not, not here to accuse anybody. All I wanted to do was when we're gonna, they just, these meetings seem like they had to be held within, you know, they were urgent to have when they're, they're discussions that were going on for over a year. So in that case, I didn't understand the importance of having them so quickly when it could, you know, when we could have them a little bit later and that it could accommodate everybody. So I'm just asking for some consideration in the matter and to move forward with it. So, you know. And I would like to get some clarification from our, our council also on this because I think it's good for me to know as a new council person because in our city charter, Article 2, Section 2.06B4 um, talks about forfeiture of off office and that the office of the council member will become vacant if you fail to attend three consecutive regular meetings of the city council or more than 30% of all the meetings that the city council held annually without being excused by resolution duly adopted by the council. And all of us 
um, maybe, and I, I'm not sure about you, Councilman Willis, but all of us work, so we're gonna have conflicts. My busy season is right now, and my busy time typically is afternoon and evenings. So I made it as late as I could, but there's, there's multiple people here, and it was a meeting that I was calling, so that's pretty important that I'm there. So I would like to know, because I know we've had this happen in, you know, with Mickey's injury and that sort of thing, um, um, if you were not able to attend, let's say I take a tech project during the latter part of the year when it's slow here for visitors, um, are you? Uh, how would we work with that? And you know, if I wasn't able to attend a workshop or a special meeting, you know, would there is does anyone on council have a problem with getting a resolution or giving a resolution to the person that wouldn't be able to attend? Or can they join electronically in another manner than showing up? Because that, that could happen to me. So I'd like to understand. Well, uh, I think the latter about can you uh, participate electronically. City attorney, if you want to help uh, state law on that one. Current state law on that is um, you can't attend elect one, uh, one, one and two council members, up to two council members, given you have five council members, um, can attend um, electronically as long as you have three that are physically present here. So in other words, you have to establish the quorum f with physical presence of three council members, and then the other, um, up to the other two council members could attend electronically. Okay, thank you. And so... And that doesn't count as a, an absence, correct, Anthony? If you're attending, no, they would be. Yeah, they would count as attendance um, telephonically. Okay. But sometimes, I mean, in my case, I'm working, so I won't be able to uh, to attend. So therefore, I'm going to miss. I'm going to have to miss several meetings. Uh, not in, by in choice, case, you know, my choice, but having to do that because of the time frame. In, in which case, the, you know, there is the charter provision that talks about failure to attend. Uh, it does excuse. Um, absences where uh, the council adopts a resolution. So a council member could request uh, an excused absence um, and the excused absence can be approved by resolution so it doesn't count as a mark against you from, for attendance purposes. Well, and I'm appreciative to know that as a new council member, I had to dig through, I dug through and looked for it because that can happen with so many of us that still work, that could happen. And I want to I want to be as considerate as I can be, but when I'm hosting the meeting, I've got to, I have to kind of work around my schedule, and so it wasn't intentional. However, it's good to know that there is an excused absence that by resolution, and that you can also join electronically, so that we know what our options are, and that way we can make. Since I've been on council, though, we've had all night meetings. This is the first time that recently that we have had daytime meetings because since I've been on this is the first time that we've started to have daytime meetings Mr. Mayor Councilmember Willis yes sir I, I have no problem with the the urgency time frame of 48 hours all of that I think if we I know we might be treading into some different territory if we shared a calendar but knowing that Someone like uh, Councilmember Davis works till four, or Councilmember Jackson might have evening commitments. If we sense that, is there some way to communicate that there are time issues? I mean, we, going forward, knowing that Councilmember Davis works till four or could not get here before four, then I would just consider that. And you know, not knowing what everybody else's schedule is, I'm pretty much open for anything. So, you know, if we wanted to have a breakfast meeting, I'd be happy with that. But, you know, that so you know, it really doesn't matter to me. But I think um, just being considerate of it, each other's uh, commitments um, when you when you can know them. If there's some vehicle that we can utilize that we know people's schedules or required commitments that they have, mm -hmm. 
I think that would be very helpful. I don't know if Sunshine Law prevents that. So in terms of calendaring, um, the ordinance actually addresses it as well. 2-57 subparagraph D does authorize the city clerk to be, to be responsible for maintaining the council's master calendar. And it talks about when scheduling council meetings, the clerk may freely propose alternative dates and times deemed appropriate to schedule. Um, it talks about special and emergency meetings based on availability of the council members. Um, so um, you can communicate through the clerk's office your availability. And um, if there are conflicts, the, I, th I think the clerk could um, propose some alternative. So we just we would just need to make the city clerk a aware of any requirements that we each have on our time. Yeah, if there's a request that's made, I mean, uh, the, the clerk can check with calendars, um, can communicate that to the requester as well um, in order to try to come, some, come up with some time where you all can meet. I just think that would probably be the easiest way around this. And uh, may I ask the city clerk, is that hard on you or is... No, that's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so we all just tell you our availability. Okay, that would work and I would appreciate the consideration of everybody. Is there, is there something in the code or maybe Anthony, um, when you request a special meeting, um, is there a way to say council member Kellum is requesting a special meeting topic is whatever, what days are you available? Is that violating Sunshine Law? Because it's like a top secret thing. You don't know who requested it, what it's about. Um, is there a way we could maybe put more information in the request? Or what's your availability for this meeting? Well, I think the code requires that you provide, um, I think some requested dates and times um, so I think you could, you could, you could put a, um, you know, a range, I guess, or an al alternative dates mm -hmm. and, you know, that would go to the clerk and then she would then check with all the council members regarding their willingness to want to have the meeting regarding the subject matter that you're requesting or, and to check on, um, alternate dates if there appear to be conflicts mm -hmm. and the date is the issue, not so much the request for the meeting. And then additionally, um, you know, the code does require, does state that the city council, when you have meetings, <laughs> when you're actually meeting, can, a council member can request um, having a special meeting or a workshop on something, and then you all are physically present, at which point you can all check your calendars and, and try, to, try to find a date if you're willing to have that meeting. So that's another option because some, not, you know, the urgency of the meeting, you know, the council's regular meeting, take, take into consideration the council's regular meeting schedule. So, you know, it might be just more appropriate just to wait until the meet, the council meeting to bring up your request for a special meeting if it, you know, if it's getting close to the regular meeting date rather than follow the procedure that was put in place a couple of years ago. And you might be able to check your calendars together. Um, but if the meeting can't wait, of course, and you want to meet before, then certainly you have a code provision that provides the process where you can, where council members can initiate a request. I like the idea. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I like the idea. If it's not of an urgent nature and has to be heard, I like the idea of, of bringing up the, you know, the special meeting or workshop at the next at our council meeting so we can discuss dates. That would work out to me for everybody in case you have commitments as well or whatever. See, it doesn't work out with me because I don't carry that calendar with me. It's at my PC at home. <laughs> so all those little logistics things and truly, I mean, it's this is a good discussion because I had no idea you come in at four or get off at four. I thought 3.30, I was, you'd said later in the afternoon. So I apologize for that, I did already. Um, but, you know, urgency, it depends on what's said too because we were expecting to bring that back in February tonight, and clearly it was too much information for a council meeting. So I was trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I know, I appreciate that. But I think we need to, you know, absolutely be, 
you know, considerate of everyone, but also it's good to know that if something comes up, we can work with that per resolution to give you an excused absence and, you know, that kind of thing. I like knowing that. Mayor. Yes. Um, I just want to make a clarification in case anybody's confused. Um, I don't know about other city clerks in other cities, but we've never maintained calendars for each council member. We maintain, and we bring this to council every November for your regular city council meeting um, schedule, and it also includes budget <coughs> meetings and um, CRA meetings, and you, you all approve those. As far as your calendar, like you keep at home, I don't, I don't maintain any of that for you guys. So when you, going forward, when you wanna call one, if you're not in each other's presence at a count, public meeting, then you'll have to share um, you know, what your calendar looks like, obviously. But I just want to make that little clarification in case anybody was confused. This this is the calendar that we're talking about that I maintain or the, our office maintains once it's approved. You know. So does that make sense? It does. Okay. Thank you, City Attorney. So w is it within Sunshine Laws for if I wanted to hold a workshop or a special meeting that I call each council person just to ask availability or email just for availability to ensure that I'm not trying to schedule it in, in a spot that is not conducive for everyone's attendance. The, um, well, to address the Sunshine Law, the, the council adopted the procedure that's in the code to work through the clerk's office. Okay. So there is an, you know, the potential to deal, have to deal with the Sunshine Law issue. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the procedure set forth in the code, I would recommend that you follow that. Okay. And that's what I had looked up, so. Sam. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Willis, yes. We just, we just got through that exercise of picking a date for the P and Z meeting, mm -hmm. and that worked fairly well. If I could add to that, Mayor. Um, looking at our screens, the, there's several methods that can be employed to do this, and Councilmember Willis is referring to method one. That's the one we used tonight. Um, and I think Councilmember Davis also said that she prefers to use that method as well. Um, the, the more, the wrinkle kind, I think, that Councilmember Davis is bringing up is when item two is made, um, not at a council meeting, to consider um, can this wait to be a number one request, I think that's what she's saying, unless it's such of an urgent nature that it can't. Um, and then what defines urgent in that case? Is it, if, if I understand, uh, Councilmember Davis, that's kind of where you're going with your, your question here. Yes, because as far as the criteria for urgent or, or emergency meetings, these, you know, we didn't know what was, this to me didn't qualify for that, so we need to understand what is an emergency meeting or an urgent situation. It's almost like number one would be preferred if there's not an urgency to it. Well, we have three types of meetings, and this code has always been a little merged, and if you, I have to read it a few times, because it talks about two different types. The heading is special and emergency meetings. However, when you get into it, it's sometimes, as in act, section two, initiated by a council member. Can I ask where you're reading? So I'm re which uh, The screen right in front of us, uh, number item two. number two. Sure thing, initiated by a council member. A council member may request a special meeting by f filing a written notice, including the email with the city clerk. That's not talking about an emergency meeting. And in fact, I'm not sure this entire paragraph speaks of emergency, and you get down a little bit, and I think it goes to into the emergency meeting right there, yep, number four. And so we have a pro what we're calling urgent, um, it, emergency meetings uh, sort of give us this uh, ability under immediate urgent or extraordinary actions by the council due to exigent cir circumstances affecting life, safety, property damage, and the business affairs of the city and environment. Um, that process is, when we talk about emergencies, that's those are the types of things that, that 
we need to meet the criteria to justify it. And I think that's, that, that meeting hasn't been requested. And I know we keep talking, using the word emergency, and I just want to be careful. We have emergency meeting language, and that can be confusing. Um, and it says there that if it's urgent, it's an emergency meeting. 24 hours is, is called a special meeting. I think we, you know, we don't have to give 24 hour notice there. Um, you have to do it in a reasonable time. And so, and then it brings them back together and be special and emergency meetings shall be limited to the purpose and scope. And so when you read through this, sometimes it's talking about one, sometimes it's talking about the other. I think the headers speak for itself. I don't. I can tell you it's difficult to schedule a meeting in the city of Cape Canaveral if you're an elected official. I can say that with a high level of confidence. Um, I've went through it. I've had the majority of my meetings rejected. And the one out of, if there's been one, maybe two, Mayor Pro Tem, how many have you successfully <laughs> requested and asked? A lot. A lot. Yeah. If my daughter, I'm missing a softball game tonight, my daughter's first uh, softball game, and if it was a batting average, I'm, I'm, I've got a low batting average. And I think that that is where the pain is. So I'm excited that we're talking about this conversation, but what I'm hearing is making it more difficult. Yes, that one exercise went smooth on that time, but I agreed to those four dates, open, honest, transparent, a little nervous because I haven't talked to my wife. <laughs> And I know when I get home, you know, there's a there's a high chance, you know, she's saying, well, why'd you do that? And, you know, I'll have to figure that out along the way. But we all have different circumstances. So the flexibility in here is important. I love the idea of sharing time blocks. And as our city clerk clarified, um, you know, it's not that she's managing our calendars. It's more about managing the approved calendar that we do every November and the associated meetings. And then when these circumstances, whether it be emergency, special, or workshop come, uh, I think it's about following the code and the, it's here. And one thing that would help is, you know, like when I sent my request, I said from, uh, I think I said from three to six or three, we had a PNZ board meeting that night. And it was more about a range for me. Any time in between, I think it was a bigger window when I originally sent it out, you know, basically 11 to, to 3. Um, I don't recall exactly what the time was, but maybe there is a, a format that would help our city clerk that could also address your issues that we at least know that, you know, the length of the meeting, I don't think our code speaks to that. I think that's important to know how, how much, like Council Member Willis asked. So when I go through, hey, I need a 90 minute block. And then once we know that, you can say any time between this big seven hour window. And wherever it fits, obviously where most council members can attend is, is best. Um, and I, I like that idea of blocking out a certain time and sending that as well as the request to the other council. You know, we need 90 minutes and this is the, the time range. Um, I think that would be helpful as well. No, no, I was finished, I think. You know, the difference between mm -hmm. special meetings and emergency meetings and anybody that was here during COVID you were on council, we had emergency meetings that had to deal with things right now. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a, f a few of them. Um, but the special meeting, and I think it spells it out in the code a few different times. I just think the block of time um, for availability would really help. Um, you know, I need 90 minutes to discuss this. And these are the times, you know, between this time and that time. I think that would really maybe help, you know, getting it coordinated and, and get everybody here. And um, it's just a back and forth thing right now. Like, you know, you send the request and then, the, you know, they, so many people said no or this person, well, did they say no because the block of time was wrong? I mean, there has to be a... 
the yeah. when you do it from our view and you go through the pro it is it is a, it's a you, it's a, it's difficult uh, go ahead. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, this maybe this is more a question for the city clerk, but we already have ten dates reserved. Mm -hmm. I saw that, that, that if if we all know that no, all right, I've got to keep these open for the potential. Um, then those are dates we should go to first, mm -hmm. and then try to configure the time because mm -hmm. it's my understanding that these reserve dates nothing else gets scheduled for this room correct that's correct so we've we've got 10 other dates that's why we put them on there all right well we need to look at them mm -hmm. and consider them if it if it fits the need of the moment so i think it if we can implement a few of these, you know, the ability to share time blocks or availability, you know, specifying the, the length, the block of time that we need, number two, looking and checking the reserve dates as a first option, knowing mm -hmm. there's a good chance we can land it. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't any conflict others? with anything else. I mean, any other city function. Yeah, we know the room's available, which is... Some, um, it's been it was an issue with mine so council member davis i know this was your item i think those are a few of the takeaways and uh 4 p.m understood uh never was intentional meeting's going to be best when all five of us can be here i believe that and so did you get to accomplish and your questions answered on how to move forward yes um so we're going to look at the dates that are reserved first if those work correct and if not, then we are just um, either going to let the city clerk know our availability when a meeting's called, or we're going to do it at council, at a regular council meeting, correct? Is that how, is That's that it. what I understand? If you're asking me, yes. No, I'm just making oh, sure I, I understand it correctly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Any other comments, City Manager? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we'll and we'll make it better if we need to. I think it was great that City Attorney and City Manager got, kind of got to hear the challenges. Um, and thank you again. If there's not anything else, we can move on to the next item. We're at 8:13 p.m. Here, item number seven is a discussion on local issues we face in Cape Canaveral, um, and. This is really a, an item that sort of intertwines, but it's some ideas, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, uh, but just uh, put something general together to start this conversation. Some of these things we're doing in different ways, but um, the idea was task force, committee, board, residents, businesses, to advocate and make recommendations of the city council. Uh, for a pedestrian friendly city. These are things that we've talked about and said, bikeable, walkable. Um, and so the group would take an active approach, potentially looking at you know, financial opportunities, but hyper-focused in Cape Canaveral. And the reason I put this on uh, was because I had a chance to meet with um, Dr. Lena Saul, who is here with us tonight and came down to City Hall, briefly got to s say hello to Todd. But Todd, our city manager, really hasn't heard even in depth. And so I like to work through the council with the council. And um, if she's willing and, and able, give her an opportunity to come forward. I printed some um, copies of the presentation that you emailed me, five or six. And I think I can give the one to the city clerk and distribute these. But um, and then also the agenda of some of the things that we talked about, really the first meeting and then the follow-up presentation. And my recommendation to her, please come forward, sorry, uh, was that, yes, uh, is that we discuss, um, we discuss this with the council. And so I'm gonna, you know, in the effort to make our city better, as vague, vague as I can be, specifically to bikeable, walkable, um, I think, 
it's a good time to listen to some of the ideas and I will distribute. I'm providing the agenda you had originally sent okay. to kind of show where the conversation started and then the uh, presentation slides as well. Um, but if you want to give an overview, sure. I think that would be a good starting point. So okay. I'm going to pass one down at a time. Thank you, Wes, and thank you, council members. And um, I'm a resident of uh, Cape Canaveral. My work is health promotion, wellness, and fitness. And my um, vision for the city of Cape Canaveral is to make it more pedestrian, bike friendly, with a keen focus on safety. I know that's definitely an issue that we have here with the influx of tourists in the area. So uh, I had, you know, brought uh, this up to uh, to Wes and met with him. I'm very thankful for his time. But the benefits of having a more walk friendly uh, community really is primarily safety. We want to focus on having a you know a healthier community, uh, equity as far as making it more safe for people who don't necessarily have cars or automotive transportation. Um, the environment, just to make the environment friendlier and healthier and more accessible without as many cars. And then the economic impact of making our area more sustainable from a walk, bike um, standpoint is really the direction that a lot of communities and especially as our population ages, uh, you see more and more people taking uh, great pride in their physical activity and wanting to be more active. Um, the, there's a, 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 a natural national uh, scoring system called a walk score. I'm not sure if you've heard of that or not. I popped my address in there just to see uh, what uh, where we're at as far as a bike and a pedestrian uh, score. But really just it helps improve the quality of life. The environmental impact is huge. Property values, uh, if you have a higher walk score, most estimates will say that the price of a home goes up $3,250. So that's a, a definite positive for the community, um, helpful for the renter, uh, rental income, and then the marketability of having a more walk-friendly community. But currently, uh, there's room for improvement, as you can see on the, the one of the slides that I have. The walk score from my address is 47. It takes a lot of things into consideration. The bike score is a little bit higher, and you know we had a, a resident here uh, give accolades for stamping the, the bike path, which is great to see. Just after Wes and I met, they were painting the, the crosswalks uh, in some of the, the streets, the perpendicular streets, to make them more uh, visible for the bikers and when cars are, are coming upon. We have a lot of tourists in the area and they may not necessarily be familiar with our, uh, our streets and our sidewalks and the increase uh, of people that are so active. If anybody, you know, I know West lives on Ridgewood. I had lived on Ridgewood until I bought my home on uh, Central. And every day you go out and you see literally hundreds and hundreds of people using the trail. So if we can, uh, my proposal would be just the creation of a board um, of directors of an advisory, you know, voluntary advisory board. It would be consisted of um, five members initially. The president would be the person that would lead and guide the rest of the board strategies um, and the strategic plan and the vision. Uh, the role of finance, um, I have some great ideas. I serve on a lot of uh, different boards. Uh, great ideas as far as having an ongoing continual uh, revenue stream generated to support this whole initiative. And uh, community and business, uh, the role of community and business just really to establish the community business partnerships. I've spoken with a lot of businesses in our area and they seem to be very interested in embracing this, this idea of making our community safer and uh, more pedestrian friendly and healthier. Education and outreach, I worked for the school district for a number of years, so education is always close to my heart. Um, somebody had mentioned having signage around just to, to promote the mission and the vision and the impact to the community. It really adds to the pride of our community knowing that it's safer for us to go out and, and walk and those who come in and um, our you know, plethora of snowbirds that we have in the area. And then infrastructure is the last one. So the, you know, exploring, working with the state and city officials uh, related to the infrastructure as far as building and making improvements. Um, so some of the areas to explore on one of the slides, uh, improvements in the sidewalks uh, along North Atlantic. I know A1A is a, not uh, owned by the city of Cape Canaveral, but having safer cro crosswalks on A1A North Atlantic. Having a safe bridge crossover. This is my, my ideal vision of how to really make the area safer with more hotels going in, with the aquarium being built, 
I see people walking down A1A and I say a little prayer to God that they'll get across the street because they're literally running across the street without any uh, safe passage um, up closer to where the home to suites and, and the, the Hilton is. Um, so having safer expanded uh, crosswalks, safer safety improvements on Ridgewood crosswalks also. Um, tourism destination, uh, having a fit community for the tourists I think is something that's a, a positive and a draw that we have the opportunity to market and take advantage of. Uh, definitely having the signage. I, I'm always in awe of the, the banner signs that we have up and down Ridgewood, but it promotes a, a sense of community, a sense of active, uh, being more active, and again, increases the pride, and then people will go out and use it. If you build anything for pedestrian bike friendly, they will come, just like the Field of Dreams. Um, I've been in Cape Canaveral for probably six or seven years. I used to come up before everything had been marked out so clearly, and um, you know, people were not using it, we're not accessing it. So you build it, you mark it, and it, you know, people have that added benefit of feeling safe. They know where they can walk, they know where they can cross. Um, and the, you know, just the difference between the city of uh, Cocoa Beach, where I lived for 18 years, and Cape Canaveral is it, it's a much more pedestrian, has a, a great opportunity to go further, but much more pedestrian friendly area. Um, great opportunity for educa educational campaigns to promote the city and fitness, and yes, we still have kids that walk to school, so that's always um, a positive thing on Cape Canaveral Elementary School. And then just great marketing opportunities in the hotel and the cruise industry. We have, um, I believe, about five million passengers uh, travel through our great community to uh, take a cruise, and so the, the volume of people that are coming here um, gives us a great opportunity for impact and reach. My future vision would be ongoing expansion with neighboring Port Canaveral and Cocoa Beach the unincorporated area in between. I'm not that familiar with it, but I do walk through it um, as I walk up and down Ridgewood almost every morning for a power walk. Um, just to expand and connect for greater safety, access, and impact. Um, really ha possibly having a Port Canaveral trail expansion. There's one that is up through the uh, Port Canaveral, uh, Cape Canaveral, and um, it's like a little hidden gem. I don't think a lot of people are really aware that it's there, so having some opportunity to expand that Definitely connecting with the aquarium. I, uh, I'm very excited about the potential of growth for our aquarium, but making it more pedestrian friendly for and safe for people to get over to the aquarium coming from the hotels, I think would be just a win-win for um, everybody involved with that expansion. And then eventually uh, George Kane Boulevard, I think would really connect Port Canaveral with Cape Canaveral. One of my favorite uh, lines always is the way to get started is to quit clapping and begin doing. So as a community resident, somebody who's de devoted and dedicated her entire career to volunteerism and leadership in vol various volunteer roles, um, this is something that I'm uh, committed to and dedicated. I'm seeking um, your recommendations for creating an advisory board. It would be something that I would lead. I'd lead with um, passion and purpose. I have a great ability to get things done well um, with others. I have a lot of experience working uh, with boards and being uh, you know, in charge of boards, uh, board presidents, chairperson, et cetera. So I just think we have a great opportunity. I don't believe there's any better time than now to go forward to make our community safer and healthier and, and to really uh, shine with all that we can do. So I thank you for your time and I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Saul. I just want to uh, echo in this uh, presentation, um, thank you for putting that together, that where, where I got excited and said I want to bring this to the council is that this it's an opportunity to innovate and to do something new and to create. And I know our brains go, well, we're already doing that. Yes, we are. There's always a we're already doing that somewhere, but this is different. And it took me some time to get my head around it. Uh, it's complementary and aligned with everything, but the opportunity to create a board uh, is a bold step. There's not been a lot of boards. Well, we don't want to create a board just to have another board. What would that board be? that's going to provide great recommendations to the city council. And what's it, that board about? Pedestrian friendly city. You know, there's the safety side of it. We want a, a pedestrian safe city, 
but the things that she put together and talked about was about the experience of Cape Canaveral too, and making it a more positive experience. And I sort of, you know, over the past few weekends started thinking about how lucky we are to have residents like uh, Dr. Saw who are willing to go out and help recruit and, 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 and put together task force committee, full blown board as we're saying here today, that lives here every single day, that wakes up here, that experiences our city. And as we improve budgets and projects, I think one of the biggest hurdles is we don't have, we've heard some good ideas. We're never gonna have too many good ideas, but the funding opportunities made me perk up too. And we've got such a talented team here with our city staff. Uh, Lexi is here tonight who works with this. Uh, Council Member Willis uh, sits on our TPO with Arlen DeBlau as a citizen advocate. Uh, Dr. Saul and I spoke about that. And I just wanted to uh, bring you in, start the conversation, and really process it for the first time and think as we're heading in, you know, how cool it would be if we could grow citizen involvement. One of the things when I first got into this was I saw the advisory board shrinking and some for good reasons, some for, for unfortunate, and boards are tough. And so when we have the opportunity to grow and to, to maybe serve different areas, um, that's something I hope this council will consider. Uh, time frame, uh, I think there would be a process to uh, to go down the, the, the board route, which our city attorney could speak to. Um, but to get started into working, I think we're about to get into our budget and capital improvement projects. I'd first say those big events, meetings that we're gonna have is um, some of the early opportunities to get involved. But this council, I think we can move as fast as we wanted to. But I didn't wanna come in with a too specific beyond the, the idea of we have someone who is willing and able and who I think has a vested interest here to wanna help contribute in this way, um, whether it be funding to make these projects happen. And if we just started with one project and said, go help us make this happen, whether it be a crosswalk or here's this one off thing, um, how do we do it? I think we should do it and I'd love to hear your ideas or feedback. And if you have any questions, I think you're here to help. Council, thoughts? Have you dealt with uh, FDOT? I have not, but I've worked for the school district and I've worked for NASA. Okay. So I have great experience working with government agencies. Mm -hmm. I have great connections also with within the county with the, um, trans the uh, transport, transportation, I forget what it is too, it's late, it's my dead time. Um, the TPO, is it TPO, the mm -hmm. VARG on TPO, um, and potentially meeting with them. Because um, when Wes and I met also, there are other communities that are exploring this, uh, this opportunity. Just the, the way Cape Canaveral is actually built, we do have that challenge of A1A um, being different. But, you know, the city of Cape Canaveral has experienced uh, pedestrian deaths, and that always, uh, unfortunately, raises uh, the awareness uh, and the, that potential action for the Department of Transportation to take steps to uh, help the communities. And so that's, that's where I go from, um, you know, my, my, the knowledge base of what's happened and then my passion for, for this and working with them. Well, Mr. Mayor, it, it appears to me that we have a uh, bed board that can work on the economic aspect of it. We have a local roads committee that their charge is to make the city more bikeable, walkable. Um, I know Lexi and I have been working on trying to find all the available funding. We even have a large listing of available grants as part of the presidential streets master plan mm -hmm. that we're going to that I know Tim is working on it as well Lexi Zach um, I've got
probably 20 or 30 different agencies through the federal government for grants here locally. I mean, I'm not poo-pooing anything, but we're doing a lot of things. And when you're integrally involved with the TPO and FDOT, um, bringing another board in, are we going to be stepping all over each other? So it's one of the things, you know, we have to, we have to be sure that we're working together and not at cross purposes. Now the, the uh, local roads committee makes up uh, individuals from every department in the city, infrastructure maintenance, uh, finance, mm -hmm. uh, city council, uh, resiliency, it's every department. The only thing that isn't there is a public participant. But we already are working on those things and we're working together for those things. So, I mean, I'm not saying no to anything. I'm just, maybe I would feel better if you had made an appearance at the local roads committee. That would have been nice to hear. If, if she would? If, or if, if she has? If she had. Um, I don't think she was made aware, but well, when see, was that's, that? Well, we have them every, other, every third month right now, but I think that and schedule is going to get upgraded. Well, yeah, and so that local roads committee, uh, you, who, who is the we? Lexi the, and Kyle Harris. It's, there's co three on the committee? There's co-chairs. No, there's, there's at least eight or nine now, I think. Yeah, and so what the, the difference here is that committee needs to continue to function and work and, and, and make recommendations. I think that sit, the city manager created that committee. Yes. And so what I'm doing is coming to the council saying, um, let, let's talk about having a resident you live in Cape Canaveral, and I think a few of the staff members do, but the majority of them are not residents. How many resident boards do we have that's focused on public safety? PNZ is a function of that. Sure, leisure services, everyone's always thinking, and the experience of Cape Canaveral. Who are the keepers of the vision? Hopefully us. But having a, a board that's complementary is essential. You're right, we cannot be stepping on each other. I don't think I see, um, I don't think we should move forward if, the, if we found that that was happening. But um, I think this might take a little time, but my hope is that it's complimentary. Lexi, I think you wanted to say something. Did you need? I was just gonna speak to the logistics of the local roads committee. So it is one um, member from every department plus council member Willis on it. They are public meetings and we do announce them. Uh, they're during normal business hours so nor during normal operating hours. Um, and so there, there are opportunities for public comment and the agenda is, is typically posted five business days prior to it. Um, we meet every other month uh, or as needed. So at least every other month, but if there's something that's of like more concern or, or requires more discussion, um, we can obviously reach out to the members and, and schedule something additional. Thank you. Can I? Uh, yes, I, Council I don't know if city manager or Anthony would ask this. All our other boards, we have people come through, we have applications, we have backgrounds, and you know, we are, they're voted yes or no. If we have a just residence board and then representing stuff for the city, is there a liability? I mean, like, what is that? Because do, do you, I, don't, I don't know if I'm explaining myself right, because we, we, we pick the boards or the people on the boards here. We know who they are, we have background like that. We won't know the residents. So what is the diff, you know? No, we, we I know our residents, but we don't have, we wouldn't go, if you're having just a residence, we're not gonna be doing backgrounds on them. We're not gonna be, oh, you're gonna no. make an official board or you're just gonna make an, I'm mis, maybe I'm misunderstanding. I'm not making anything. I think we're starting the conversation and the board's the idea. We would, we would have to follow the procedures. We appoint board members and I yeah. don't see this board being treated differently than okay, any other I, board. Then I misunderstood yeah. that it wouldn't be treated the same way as, no. A re, okay. Yeah, I think following our own code on the, the procedures to create a board that's serving a, a niche that's 
that's not just around pedestrian you know, safety. It's, as I was saying, the experience and the upside. And, uh, you know, when we're safe, we're, we're enjoying the city more. But, yeah, that's, that's good. And so I think that the next step that, that I'd like to take is um, the, ne the next meeting in March. Uh, March 20th, uh, third Tuesday, is that we come back with uh, some thoughts and ideas on, well, really just want to know, do we want to do a board or do we want to do a task force or committee or do we want to do nothing at all? My hope was that we plant the seed and that between now and the next meeting we could work, overcome any questions and discuss creating a dedicated citizen resident led board. Um, again, another requirement with an exception of the bed board, they're allowed to come from out of Cape Canaveral, but it's hard to find, you know, there's not, there's not a dedicated health experience pedestrian safety, 100% uh, resident-led board in Cape Canaveral. That was directed by this council. The committee was directed by the city manager with people who, the majority of the people on that board do not live in this city. And code enforcement board was abolished. All that citizen, seven of them. Planning and Zoning Board, seven of them in other very, you know, quasi-judicial land use matters, very code and, and land use related. But who's out there for the human being that, that lives here every day and can see it? I'd say local roads committee happening, exercising is something I was excited about, and I'm happy our city manager took that initiative to do that. But bringing it a step further, I think, getting our head around this today is a good idea. And so if we want to um, give it some time, I think between now and the next meeting, we can maybe get our arms around something. Councilmember Jackson or Mayor Pro Tim Kellum? Um, yes, I just have a couple of questions. Um, you said that you could recruit people to take these positions, finance, community, and business. Um, and what would you call this board? Uh, what well, to be, be determined. I to be, yeah, to be determined. We, we didn't okay. want to you know, get locked in with a name, but that, I appreciate that. Um, that's a good down. question. I yeah. mean, that is sort of what I'm asking. And I'm trying to say, Council, broaden. Obviously, it's not roads. But let's think about, do we need another board? Here are some ideas. Um, and again, we're talking board. Maybe it's a, a, a committee that the council or whatever the procedure is. How do we utilize this? Mayor Pro Tem, back to you, sorry. We do have a beautification board. Could we do beautification and health for, I mean, I'm just throwing out ideas, but have you served on any of the boards in the city? Not in the city of, of Cape Canaveral. I've served on several boards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of the resident-driven resident board um, for these reasons. Um, I'm open to the idea. I think that it, we should move forward, maybe explore it some more, um, and maybe add it, kind of rework the boards that we have now maybe with and mm -hmm. initiate this, these concepts into an already established board, maybe. Um, I am interested in all of these things sound wonderful, so. Can I? I'm, yes, I agree, I mean, I'd love to see all this implemented, but I kind of agree with, with Councilman Willis. We need to figure out how much overlapping we have with the boards, you know, we would have with the boards that we have now, and maybe instead of creating a board, which I, I would encourage, you know, the, the citizens, maybe just get involved with the boards we have instead of 
you know, doing another board that's overlapping the same as the boards we already have. So that's just some consideration, something we have to find out. Will they be overlapping, you know, or is it repetitive or whatever before I would say get a new board? I would say, you know, be involved in the boards we have now. Yes, I think that's a good starting point is I'm not saying we must get involved with the new boards. I'm saying we need to look at our boards and think what's missing mm -hmm. and we have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's something missing. And, and I think if anything, you have the ability to fill it and to give it the same energy that we saw from Stu Smith with reviving the Business and Economic Development Board. That board was created and it went fizzle done. And thankfully, not only Stu, but we've seen a, a, a big, uh, a full board come in with city staff's help and, and that board is active and moving forward and it is complimentary, but yeah, that was the thought. You know, Council Member Jackson? Well, <laughs> I need to be more familiar with the Business and Economic Development Board because the meeting that I went to most recently um, spoke a lot about the hotels and things like this. And where all of that brings tax re revenue into our city, which does help us as citizens, I, I find it interesting and I think this is very niche okay, and could be broader because of the fact that there's so many things that we drive over the bridge to get to. Mm -hmm. We don't have certain things here in our area for residents, and I think residents could give us that feedback on what those things are, um, because we're focused on taking care of making sure we've got the cruise industry covered on hotel nights. I, I saw the information about rentals well right now the rental income well right now you know we have a full house right now this year as usual but we've fallen back into our normal rental patterns for vacation rentals and then the hotels are picking up anything less than that so they literally are getting every bit of business that is shorter than the six night minimum mm -hmm you know, as mandated in our ordinances. But then there are things such as, we don't have a grocery store in our town. We don't have certain types of businesses. Um, and we're looking at making this more walkable and an area where people come off of that bridge speeding every day. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, we're working with FDOT on what's gonna happen to that part of the A1A corridor for beautification. But I think that this becomes fairly niche. We've got problems down on A1A with people riding bikes on sidewalks, e-bikes. I've seen a golf cart on the sidewalk. Um, and so I get the bikeable, walkable, mm -hmm. um, but with the focus that we've got up on A1A, and of course we need to for safety um, and it just brings to mind what is what do citizens want residents what are they wanting and I think in that case if the board was more general had some more general capacities to it that it would be a great place for people to be able to give that feedback because there are things that we are missing in our city that Cocoa Beach has that um, we drive over to Merritt Island to utilize things of that nature. And so if we're really looking at expanding our economic development and catering to residents, we might wanna look at what are they wanting, you know? Um, although I think a resident-driven board is an excellent idea mm -hmm. to give uh, the residents the, the voice mm -hmm. that they need and to be able to bring things to us. And they can always, anything that they come up with, we can always engage with staff and the others to accomplish those things. So I, I like the idea, but I would like it. My, uh, my vision is it'd be a little bit broader than just walkable, walkable bikeable. Mm -hmm. and, and I think so too. And what, what do the citizens want? 
thank you very much. That feedback, anything you want to add into that? Uh, no, and, and I just really appreciate the, uh, the, the questions and the points. What I always uh, approach anything with is a collaborative approach. And so um, working with the other boards uh, collaboratively, collaboratively to me would be the ideal approach. Um, it is niche indeed, uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, if you make your community safer and healthier, they will walk to a grocery store. Popping at a grocery store will not necessarily make people be able to, to go there. And I, I will bike to Publix on occasion, and you know. Uh, and in that, that lot, yeah. and in that case, I and you have to understand, I'm a research person. I think we need to look at demographics. Sure. And here's why. We've got an older aging population. A lot of them do bike and walk, and that's great. We also have decline in enrollment at Cape View Elementary. And so, um, you know, our demographic may, and we have a lot of veterans that are wounded and people of that nature. So I think we need, before we go completely headlong into something like that, that we need to know what's our demographic. Because if we're, even if we're not spending taxpayers' dollars like you've discussed on this, we want to make sure that we're meeting their needs. Absolutely. And, and you know, I was uh, performing a, a, an inquiry or a survey or questionnaire that would be brief, um, would all be a, a positive for uh, gathering that ground information as to uh, what, what people want. So that's... I always start everything out with a survey, like what do you want, and then how can we make that happen and, uh, for the majority of the people. But yeah, definitely working collaboratively, not taking from the other boards, and you know they no doubt have uh, their tasks that they're working towards and striving towards. And, 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 and indeed, this is niche, but I think it's something that's doable in our community. I think we have a great opportunity now. Uh, to do it and working side by side with with all entities and if uh, indeed if it's what the community wants i tend to think it might be what the community wants um we get older we want to get more active we want to you know live healthier and live longer and taking into consideration all of the points you made uh, Ms. jackson definitely um i love that you're a researcher too as am i so that's great so great. thank you I, I i if there are no other questions thank you um Wes for this opportunity and, and I thank the council members just for the consideration. Um, if we can get started on the possibility and the what ifs, I think it would be uh, great for a win-win for our community. I think it'll, it'll come together and doing it right. It's appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Your, uh, I know your time is valuable to stay here today, so thank you again. And you know, my, my comments on and I've said this in the past, our city staff professionals, experts within their area, and some of them wear many hats, are gonna be the best to make the recommendations that we need, especially when we're talking about dimensions and codes and laws and criteria and all that. We, we, we would be tripping over ourselves without them. But you, and we're all residents up here, have to be, uh, do something that they can do in their communities, which is ours. We all love Brevard and we love our city staff, but you're the only one who understands your street like like the way you do and in your city. And so that survey and that data that we can get out of those people uh, are, I think, the, the pillars to making great decisions. So thank you again. This will form and shape. I know it will. And we will be in touch. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. OK. Again, thank you, council. Uh, I will continue to develop that. And I think either the next meeting or the following, I think we'll, we'll be able to, to have a little bit more to work with there. So thank you again. Now we are at the report section of the meeting. That concludes. I do have uh, one report, but I don't want to go first. I want to go through uh, council. Um, I have two. 
two requests, and I'll go last. Council, we are finished. Reports. Uh, City Manager, do you want to kick us off with the reports tonight? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, as a result of the January 24th special meeting regarding Jackson Avenue and Fillmore Avenue, what I'm planning to do is provide a, a full up-to-date status report of where we are, and there's a, been a lot of movement on that. I want to provide that when proposing at the March Council meeting, um, so we should have a lot. It should be a very robust report about where we are and our status at that point. Um, and secondly, the uh, coffee with the city manager is this uh, Friday at 10 o'clock at Manatee Sanctuary Park. Mayor. Thank you. And I'm sure you might have to chime back in. And one of those was the Jackson and Fillmore. So thank you for you answered that. I think having, um, Having enough time, I think, for that one will be important. Um, and my hope is that we are in a position to have most of that resolved by that, that time. Uh, I don't like those special meetings either. And I think th that your work since that meeting's happened with staff, I, you've all had a chance to talk, is uh, you're getting through it. We've come a long way. Is there anything that we can do as a council to support you that, that maybe we didn't see at that time? To I can't think of anything. You, you get, the council's been tremendously supportive, um, given more tools than I even would have asked for. So no, I can't think of anything, but uh, I, I'm grateful that the meeting happened because it, it brought things to light, I think, that wouldn't have otherwise been brought to light, and it was very helpful. And, and Mayor, thank you for, for suggesting that meeting. Thank you for continuing to work through it, uh, you know. Councilmember Jackson, did you want to, I saw you, or? Well, I was going to ask if their utilities got buried. <laughs> I was just curious if we've gotten that far yet. Yeah, the, the, I was there when they were doing the, uh, the conduits underground, and Dave told me that they're energized uh, today or yesterday, was it? They're, so they've got those, you, the electrical utility is done. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe they're still waiting to get the cable for the Bright House line put down before they can take the pole and the overhead lines down. Well, that's great progress because that's the hardest, one of the most difficult things is working through the power company to get those things done. So that is good news. Thank you. Yeah. And the engineering, I think today you said the agreement. Yes, uh, Kim Lee Horn did agree to the proposal task order $7,250 is the price tag for that. It was authorized, um, it was forwarded to them today, Dave, is that correct? Yeah. What was it? It's a proposal task order? Yeah, it's the... It, it's the a contract? Or? And if you go, yes, it's the minutes from item, item one of the consent agenda. Uh, there were two sets of minutes, January 24th minutes. There's a very specific... Uh, task. I think Mia's almost there. You're on the 24th. You're, you're right there. So I, item two, mm -hmm. obtain the engineering report. There yep. it is. That task, 2A and B, that is what was contracted to Kimley Horn as a result of that meeting. Uh, they came in at $7,250 for that report, which um, I, I, I reviewed this with each council member to make sure we're hitting the mark, and every one of you said, yep, that sounds like exactly what we need to be doing there. Spent a lot of time on the language of this to get it, make sure we got it right. So to fulfill item number two, obtain an engineering report, mm -hmm. they, an agreement was signed for, we didn't know the price, $7,250 for Kimley Horn to provide and fulfill this. To A and B, yes, sir. Did they give us a time frame on how long that's going to take? Dave, in, do you the, recall in the agreement, does it talk about time in the agreement? And do we can we have a copy of that agreement sent sure. out to the sure. whole council? Sure. Please. Um, yes, we can distribute that tomorrow to the council. Um, and I've also um, um, provided some details on the agreement to the homeowners there so they're very aware and plugged into what Thank exactly you. is going on um, no the 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 scope or the contract does not have a spe specific date um, that the the report is due by um, we did we have spoken 
with them about the, um, the expediency is extremely critical, that we are trying to get a final report back to the council at the March meeting. Um, so there is kind of an inherent built-in deadline for them. Um, we discussed when our agendas go out, when our agenda items are uh, due to the city manager and the city clerk's office. So, so I would imagine that we would, um, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to give any specific deliverables at this point, but they, they understand there is a, um, um, some deadlines built in that we're wanting to perform and get some answers back to the council. That's great. Yes, I think to overcome any ambiguity, it would be good to get an indication from them. Certainly not, you shouldn't bear the pressure to speak what they think they can get it done so that we can set expectations. I'd hate for us to be optimistic and we come in March and it's not as far as long. Um, again, this is, an, this is a very important issue to me and I know we sort of exhaled after that, but this issue is up there with A1A safety and flooding. And, I, and I'm thankful for the work that goes to it, but I, do, I would like an update at every council meeting, I think moving forward until this is resolved. And I think if we get to April, um, that, that's too far, and, and, and I'm certainly impatient to that. So hopefully they can make it work. And again, what resources that we can provide as a council to support that, I'm on board, so thank you. Any other comments on that one? Councilmember Willis? Uh, yeah, um, just wanted to give the update on the local roads committee. We had uh, a meeting on uh, January 23rd and we discussed the lot striping over in the Civic Hub property bike lane striping, roadway striping around the city. Uh, got an update on the presidential streets one-way feasibility study. We also uh, discussed some funding updates for FDOT, A1A. And we uh, talked about the uh, best foot forward compliance event that happened on North Atlantic. Um, to four different days in February uh, where Brevard County Sheriff's Department and uh, Best Foot Forward uh, came in and made sure that people were adhering to the pedestrian crossing restrictions. And I think they made four or five stops. I don't have the, uh, the final report in front of me, but uh, people wouldn't stop when pedestrians were entering the crosswalk. So that was, that was very beneficial. We also found out that a lot of people along North Atlantic and, uh, are seeing a definite increase in traffic from the port. And that roadway is not mm -hmm. designed for that kind of traffic. A lot of it is just coming from the port or Jetty Park trying to get to A1A and they think the quickest best way is jump on North Atlantic and get there. So we're, we're looking at possibly doing a traffic study or getting TPO to help with doing a traffic study and coordinate it with the port to see if uh, we need to do something about restricting that traffic. Um, also we had uh, first Monday of February, I did the uh, coffee with the cop at Cherry Down Park and picked one of the coldest, nastiest days of the month. Um, and it was the first time that all the coffee had ever been drunk at one of those things. Uh, we had 30, 30 local uh, neighborhood members uh, show up at Cherry Down Park and it was very good. They asked a lot of great questions of Commander Keck and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he made a few jokes, but uh, we won't go there. So. Uh, but that's all I've got. Thank you, Councilmember Davis. Yeah, uh, I went to the Space Coast League of Cities. There's two things. I think uh, you were emailed a scholarship form. So if you know of anybody that uh, would, is interested in the scholarship, our deadline is March 1st. So they can still they can still apply. Uh, second, we have we discussed the form six, the financial uh, form that we we may be required to fill out. 
uh, City of Coco is having a meeting on March 18th. It's going to be at the Civic Center in Coco Village. I believe it starts six, like six to eight. They're going to be discussing the requirements when we do have to fill out the form. Also, um, I don't know if Attorney Googleman will be there or not, but his law firm has developed a class action suit uh, to file so against this Form 6. I think there's, as Anthony said, there's 25 cities now involved. It's $10,000 for the city uh, to get involved in that. And then what they're trying to do right now is get an injunction for a stay so that you don't have to fill out the Form 6 until the decision is made. Only the people that have been in the cities that have given the $10,000 that are involved in it will be granted the stay. Although I thought it was statewide, but it's not. So that's something, um, if you're interested, to, I, I, I would suggest that all of you go to the meeting on the 18th. And it is open to city managers, city clerks, all elected officials or whoever. So it's gonna be very beneficial to what we're gonna be required to fill out in these forms. And I don't know if Googleman will be there about the lawsuit. So that's something we, this, we need to discuss as well if the city is interested in doing something like that. And I think we would need Anthony's ob opinion on that as well. So just March 18th, uh, Coco Civic Center at six o'clock. I think you got an email too about that one. Thank you. Uh, the, the March 6th thing primarily will be what do you have to fill out? What do you have to say? What granularity you're going to have to yeah. contribute? And uh, we all know how granular that might be, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I will be on the logo. You said the city clerk sent it today, our city clerk. Um, I don't know when you sent it me. It was a couple days ago, I think. Okay, I know I've seen it. And then From the, you, okay. And the application was sent out. The scholarship application was sent out as well. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Jackson? Well, Ms. Freeman gave part of my report, which is with the right well, which is a good thing, and we're happy that that's moving forward. Um, for those that were not in attendance, we did have a workshop on EVs and taking a look at the state of the industry as well as what reporting the city council might want to see so that we can make sure that we stay in a profit, a profitability or at least covering ourselves mode on that. So that was held during February and that's what I have for an update. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, yes, just a couple things. Um, the local VFW has taken uh, advantage of the grant program through our CRA funding, which is awesome. And they're um, redeveloping their uh, memorial wall on the side of the building. It's starting to look really good. And I'm glad that we could help them with the funding. Also, I'd like to thank Dave and his his um, team and, and um, Todd and Anthony for really um, getting on the Portside Villa uh, people that were really suffering there with the dust and everything. And it was nice to get a thank you from, from those people that we are listening and we are doing what we can. So I just want to thank you guys for, give you a pat on the back instead of, <laughs> yeah. But thank you for your work on that. And, um, you know, we do care about our residents and we need to take care of these things. So that's all I have. Thank you. The, uh, I think that's me left and uh, anyone other, I just want to knock this out. Uh, we heard today from uh, Miss Bonnie uh, Cocker about the need to remove, or excuse me, prune the sea grapes. I think it would be helpful, our city manager and I spoke about this, is do you need anything from us uh, to help expedite whatever they need. I think there are, there are really two essential issues, and, and I'll be calling on Dave to help answer some of this, but there's the work that they are authorized to do with the lowering of the sea grapes in accordance with FDEP guidelines. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the removal of palm trees from city right-of-way property. So 
if we can just separate the two issues for just a moment. Dave, what have they been told about FDEP guidelines and their ability to pursue lowering of sea grapes on their property and on the city right of way property? Yeah, um, thank you, Todd and, and city man, um, city council. This, this has been an issue for the last couple of years. It seems to boil up every once in a while. And um, last time was in early 2023. Uh, as a matter of fact, some folks from Sand Pebbles approached uh, staff and were inquiring, which we'd love to see. Thank you for asking before things happen uh, versus um, after. And so based on that, um, Brian Palmer and the rest of the city staff put together an FAQ. Uh, it's on the city website. And it's referred to as the City of Cape Canaveral Beach Management Guidelines. It's a really helpful uh, uh, information. And it talks about um, a number of things, notably dune plants to include um, uh, sea grapes, uh, seaweed, and our turtle population. And so there's just some basic information about what can and can't happen. Uh, related to those three items, who to contact, who has jurisdiction, and all the links and information and contact names and numbers are here in the, uh, in the FAQ. And so um, with respect to the sea grapes, because I think that's really what we're talking about this evening, um, yeah, there is a, uh, anything eastward or seaward of what's called the coastal construction line. And that information, where that line is, is all, uh, it's a link on this page. So all that information is available to the public. Anything that occurs eastward of that line, uh, DEP has jurisdiction. And they have, they have rules and regulations on what can and can't happen and, and, and who to contact. Um, so I think what I heard is somebody did contact DEP about this. And um, so that's great. That's, that's what we encourage people to do. The city doesn't specifically have any regulations or any codes regarding the uh, maintenance of sea grapes. Um, so we rely on DEP for their permitting. And it may be a situation where DEP says this is not a permittable, uh, it's, it, it doesn't even qualify for a permit, go ahead and do it. Um, those are calls that uh, the DEP needs to make. That is not a city staff uh, decision. So we encourage people to get with DEP. The, the, the role that the city plays is when those activities are wanted to, uh, when a property owner wants these things to happen on city property. Um, at that point, that's when the city and the council would get involved on giving specific authorization to enter city property and um, conduct any desired maintenance that, that occurs there. So we would be involved in, the, in that aspect of it. Um, other and Dave, than, in this case, have they been given any permission from the city to enter city property to do that sea grape trimming? Not, a, not that I'm aware of. Um, they're, they're like, uh, I mean, we've discussed it. We've discussed the process, but as far as I know, there's been no specific um, request or permission given. Is and there that, any holdup? Is there any reason not to grant it? Well, no. No, I mean, okay. as, long as, as long as there's an indication by DEP that the proposed activities are going to be consistent with their guidelines, I, th I think, I mean, that would be a call that it, the, the council can make at that point. Um, I, I do want to point out, and I don't want to get too far into policy tonight. I'm, I know we're talking about process and moving forward with things, but there, there's some good information in here. And, and, I, and I want to point out, too, that one of the things that this really, this document really stresses is our, our turtle population. And it's critical to always keep in mind that there's views both to the beach and there's views from the beach. And that's primarily what we're concerned about are the views from the beach landward. That's where our hatchlings get in trouble when there's not enough, um, I'll call it visual buffer. Um, they see the lights. We actually, one of our code enforcement officers, spends a, a lot of his time walking up and down the beaches looking for violating lights um, that could disorient our hatchlings. And so when we start, I, and I'm just, DEP has, they look at all of these issues when they're issuing a permit or not issuing a permit. But that is just something to keep in mind, too, is we have, I mean, I, I understand property values and I understand the importance of, of views. 
but there's other considerations too that we need to keep in mind. So it's kind of like a, you know, it's it's a it's a in, it's a totalitarian. It's a you have to look at the issue in totality. So, um, but that's it. I think. Is there something I didn't answer? Is there a standard that we want to keep our dunes at for a height for cedar turtles? Uh, that we, the city does not specifically regulate that. That would be a question for DEP. Okay, so DEP currently allows it to be trimmed down to three and a half feet, as I understand it. I'm I'm not I I I wouldn't feel comfortable answering that. I mean, it sounds like there's been some conversations. Yeah. In the yes. She needs to speak at the point. Yep. Hey, Miss Tina, if you are going to speak, if you no, that's okay. Just for order and, and the folks who might be listening from home, if you could come to the the microphone, uh, the podium, and speak. That way, everyone can hear uh, yeah, you. Thank you. You are correct in that it is a totality. And um, one of the things regarding the turtle population, we cannot cut and trim during nesting season. So, you know, from June to November, we cannot do any trimming. And so that's one of the um, things we have to be compliant with. Another is the lighting. And so um, to that regard, we have to have curtains closed. We have to have, if you don't have curtains, you have to have your shutters down. We also have lights um, outside, but they are blackened on the side that faces the beach. And then we have to have only low light um, on inside the condominium. We have to have all the porch lights off. So there's all those other things we have to be compliant with. But as far as the sea grapes go, we can be down to 42 inches and it's three different agencies that oversee, you know, the dunes. And I put that in that piece of paper that I turned in. And so we've done this for years. Um, well, what we're wanting to do is we want to make sure that we, um, that code enforcement and us on the same page, as well as the Brevard County Sheriff's Department, so they don't get calls. And instead, perhaps they could go to the city and say, is this correct, before they go out and say, okay, everyone drop your tools, you have, you can't work, you know, that type of thing. So um, there's, yeah, you're right though, there is several areas in which we have to be compliant and which we have been doing. But 42 inches is what um, they're saying, and we don't need a permit. Um, for that, and that's why we went and looked at other um, condominiums who are also compliant, and we found at least six or seven um, that we made um, on that document that um, are 42 inches. Now, and some of them are 48 inches, but um, the bottom line was 42. Yeah, we, 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 the city, we generally don't get too involved in this. If, if they have DEP permits, mm -hmm. we have been involved over the few years that where we have HOAs or condo associations that have just clear cut and brought the sea grapes mm -hmm. all just just to grade, and that's 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 a real problem. But we've but also had the problem with the um, the Brazilian red pepper vines that have come in and been very invasive and covered over the sea grapes and the sea oats. But it and that came in with the hurricane and it's not yeah. indigenous, you know, yeah. to Florida and it just blew with the hurricane. So we've been, and it's got big thorns, and we've been battling that as well. Yeah, I, I, yeah. We, but my point is we have a process. Um, the DEP has a process, and I agree. We should all be communicating um, so there's no surprises. Right. So uh, f f on your side as well as our side. Right. So. And Mark, our one big question, though, is the city property as it pertains to the beach boardwalk. When you, you know, because the city maintains that beach boardwalk and puts yes. signage up and all that. And we're wanting to do both sides of the beach boardwalk, not just our side, but you know the south, the side. south side, which is where Windjammer is located. And we want to know, can we cut down on that south side as well? And is that considered city property? Yes, um, the, the city right away for Fillmore, or is it Fillmore? Uh, yes. The 50 foot width of Fillmore as it runs east-west, it continues all the way out to the Water line, basically. Okay. So yes. So Both. 50 feet from the beach boardwalk. No, no, no. Uh, the right Total. of way is 50 oh, feet wide. The, the, the right of the, the right of way itself is 50 feet wide. 
So from the center of the boardwalk, go 25 each way? Yeah, if, depending if, if it's in the center. If the boardwalk is in the center, but yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We'd so be happy to, if, if you'd like to stop by our office in the next day or two, we'd be happy to kind of sit down and walk right. our way through this. Okay, because that's, that's one of the issues we have is we're wanting to do both sides. Sure. And um, so we have to 25 feet from the center of the beach boardwalk. So, Mayor, I think one of the... Th one of the things perhaps we're struggling with here is that we don't have a procedure for how to answer the question. Does it need to go to city council to be authorized to reduce CO heights on a city right of way property? There's a question. Um, and if so, should we just begin to a procedure for that to happen? Because this sounds like it will be a routine maintenance thing, maybe coming up every year or two. Um, and we can create the procedure. Um, and if we do that, what I would suggest, and I was just talking to the city attorney about is whoever, if we were to authorize it, that the contractor provide the liability insurance to the city, naming the city as all, all, you know, additionally insured. FDEP guidelines would have to be approved, permit or permit exception. Um, so if, if there's the appetite for that on the council to do that, we can, we can improve this one and just understand, we can just write our procedural guidelines for, for the future from that, um, and I think that's the first thing to get over actually, before we talk about the palm trees. Well, to, I mean, all these condominium associations all up and down here, you know, they pretty much maintain the C grades in front of their condominium units. Like I said, I counted at least seven that are doing it to the 42 inches. And I just can't imagine all these condominium associations and their boards wanting to deal with more bureaucracy of layers and layers. We've already got three agencies that we're dealing with on the state level that manage the dunes. <laughs> and to add another layer of bureaucracy, we just want to get everybody on the same page that we're on that when we're compliant with the state. Now, Ms. Freeman, I have a question for you since you've been talking to the state. Because when I know at my property, when we cut them down, Ours were so overgrown, we had to cut them in three phases. They, now, are they one still, third. yeah, they, so one third. Right, when they're considered trees and they're over six feet, mm -hmm. then you can cut them down one third in your first cutting. And then you can go down, the next cutting down to 42 inches. And okay. so um, we've already got ours at six feet, Okay. we're wanting to go down to the 42 inches. Okay. And that's where we don't need a permit. But you're right, though, as far as the phases go. Okay, I wanted to... find as far as keeping them at the six feet level, um, and we've been doing that, but we're wanting to go down to the 42. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, as we've heard, to move forward with the north side and behind on Fillmore, they don't really need anything through the city, but they need to have clear understanding where the lines of the city right away begin and end. I think that's what's at risk, because we don't want to be in a position where you go into the city right away. So that decision is something that I think you're talking about we've never really considered. Should we prune the north side? Because those condos, I don't think they're pruning the north side on the city right oh, away. Oh, we're, right? we're doing the north side of the beach. Oh, I'm so, right? sorry, the south, south side. side. Right. The, all of our south side, I know mine on Harrison, is higher and, and provides shading because it's south facing to that. That's directly in the line, I think, as a part of it. And then the trees. We don't ha how do we handle removing trees and pruning on public property? Typically, you as the city manager have the authority. However, you also can work with your council. I think when trees start to be removed, you're one of the first to speak. This is one I, I'd like to know. Yeah, tree removal on city property has been a very sensitive topic in recent years. So, and so, but they can proceed <coughs> well, on the north side mm -hmm. with the sea grapes. With the sea grapes. When we say north side, we're not talking about the north side of the city right away. We're talking From about the, the private side. property. We're talking about the south side of the beach walk. And then, yeah, you got to, excuse me, can I, can I just city interject attorney, because it's about property interests, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, there are, I don't know how many condominiums up and down the beach. Each, if you look at the declarations of covenants of those condominiums, You'll find, in all cases, because I've reviewed probably every single one of them, you know the boundary of the common area goes out to the 
you know, mean high water line, right? And that was that was moved when Brevard County established the erosion control line. But so the right of way is just like your condo property. It goes out to the mean high water line as well. So you your condo has the ability to do the, the routine maintenance of the uh, sea grapes within your boundaries of your property. Correct. Now, when you were talking about the right of way, the city controls the right of way and would have to authorize any maintenance of the sea grapes within the right of way. South of the right of way, it's my understanding, is the wind, wind jammer? Oh, correct. So that's wind jammer's property. And you know, we could not authorize you to go on the south side of the right of way on Windjammer's property to do any work. We could do 25 feet of the beach walk on that south side, but no farther. If the city auth if the city authorized the work to be done in the right of way, right? There's gonna be a center line of the right of way, 25 feet on each side of the center line of the right of way, wherever that is. Right. Right. 25 feet on Windjammer, typically. Well, that's uh, Windjammer is south of the of the southern right of way line. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make it clear mm -hmm. that it's all about property interests. Mm -hmm. Who controls which property? You know, your association controls your property. The right of way is controlled by the city, and then Windjammer's controls their property. Mm -hmm. Right? Consent would be required from the property owner to do any work within their property, mm -hmm. including the city, right? So that, that's what needs to, be, needs to be clear. And I think the manager's saying, um, we may not have had a, have a process or we don't routinely m maintain the beach end um, sea grapes. Yeah, and June, do you have some historical knowledge on maintaining the sea grapes or Tim? Because I believe, if I'm, if my memory serves me, we had inmate crews at one point that were out there cutting that. Oh yeah, that was years ago. And yes, and um, but with respect to Windjammer, um, they maintain the front of their condominium complex facing the beach, but it's just that they don't maintain along that boardwalk. And we've done it for them in the past, but it depends on who who's on the board when they allow it. As, so, as far as the, the city's right-of-way property, Tim, what's the history of trimming the sea grapes on that property? So in the last eight years, when I was with infrastructure maintenance, we would tell the uh, residents and the condo owners that we wanted it to be natural for turtle preservation and things of that nature on the city easement, on the city, but now right away. on private property, uh, they were allowed to cut a third, as you said, per year, mm -hmm. um, and uh, until it got to a certain height. Right. So, but for the city right away property, we normally just let it kind of grow um, to be a natural habitat uh, for the turtle preservation and, and other things. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I remember uh, right. in the years that I did. And so it, what was happening with ours was that when we were letting it grow, it was doing an overhang. And then we had a lot of the homeless population camping out in there. Mm -hmm. So then we were able to cut it down and that cut out the homeless population from camping in there. So essentially we have a request council um, that the neighboring property would like the city's permission to reduce the height of the sea grapes in the city right of way. Does the council want to agree to that request? Yes or no? I think that's the simple question. Correct. I think I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> I use the word hyperlocal. You know, what's best for Fillmore Avenue? You talk about ultra home rule, right? When I start talking about what happens on your our street, you know, it's different. I, I speak for to the best of one citizen on Harrison Avenue. And I, I, I like mine, but it's also totally different view. I'm looking north, and so I've had an opportunity to see, and I know those palms over time, which we showed, sort of popped up, and so it reaches this 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 decision of, hey, with the palm or the sea grapes, I'm sorry, as those grow, is it healthy? Should we maintain them? 
can they get too strangly and lag and become? I would not want to see just a, you know, a, a, a wipeout where I am, but if the majority of the residents around that area think that that's a good idea uh, for that, it, you know, home rules, right? Street rules. And to me, to, to maintain, and if there's a healthy prune that can happen, um, and it, it's just easier to talk about it all. And really the trees fall into this too, right? Same thing. So there's palms that were not there. We were just dealing with this at Veterans Park. Some cabbage palm, they just pop out and then they become a tree and then we're handcuffed to them. <laughs> and I love trees, but you know, successfully relocating palms, I think is, has a higher probability of success as opposed to a big live oak. And so, and we love our oaks. We're talking about palms. I wrestled with it with the city manager and said, you know, I don't know, I really want to talk to the council about it. I don't want to speak for Fillmore. Um, and I know it's, it's a Florida beach. It's people from all over come here. But, you know, our local residents who live there and who experience that beach entry more than others, um, we don't have a process. I first would say if it's beneficial for us to prune and to maintain all beach entrances, by all means, we should. Um, but I see the benefits of having the protection and the shading. And I have also seen the dark downsides of witnessing people, strangers, in there sleeping at night and walk down there in the middle of the night and it's a you go to Harrison Avenue it is a little mini mansion in there and it I mean you've got coverage at, to get out of the wind and the elements and fortunately thanks to our deputies I haven't seen that in a in a, in a long time and it's been maintained seems like within and I will pull up a carrot wood from time to time I'm sorry y'all can throw me in jail but when a little carrot wood pops up on the edge, that city property, you know, it's like I pulled a weed. And so that those things, there's like, what happens if I let that carrot wood go? And now we get this big invasive species just popping up. Or what do we do with these specific palm trees here? I, I think the I think what I see happening is a, we're developing a procedure tonight that the question should come to council if a particular condo board wants to clear, or not clear, reduce the height of sea grapes and or any other vegetation. And this council, I think, can make that decision tonight to grant it or not, both the sea grape lowering and or removal of how many palm trees? Four. Five palm trees, and they're like more than six feet high. And they're all located in the city right of way. So that, that's a question, Mayor. You could just pull your council and see how they feel about it and let and consensus make a decision. To re relocate? Um, that, that could be a condition. I, I would be, a, you know, that's first priority, but the next beach entrance might want them. Um, thoughts? Relocating is probably going to be very difficult. The root ball is not that bad on a Yeah, ball. but getting in there, two of them. The equipment. Yeah, because what are you going to do? You're going to come from the beach side or through the property. Mm -hmm. You can't come through the beach side. We just planted a whole bunch of sea right. well, there. I'd also like the council to remember, too, that we have a, a, a process for a private property owner to, re, to remove trees. Mm -hmm. And there is a mitigation bank that can be paid into. Um, there's also replanting that can be done. So, so there's a number of things that the council can consider when you would be saying, okay, well, yes, we'd like to, you can remove X number of trees, but there's, there's going to be a cost for that. The same way we just, because it's on public property versus private property, um, you know, that might be something too to throw into the mix and think about. And, okay. Thank you. Councilmember Willis, Councilmember Davis. I know it can be you guys. Councilmember Jackson. Well, I'm just trying to remember back what we've been told, you know, on trimming because I understand that people want to have a view. I do. But I'm someone that likes trees. And we have properties up and down the beach that haven't taken the trees out. They're not doing that. And I'm trying to remember because I did look at the coastal construction line. I found it interesting that one property, it went right over the middle of the property. 
um, and you're not supposed to do anything on the eastern side of that. So, you know, allowing the sea grapes to be trimmed down is something that many complexes do. Um, but allowing palm trees to be removed, I don't know what DEP's rules are on that. Well, we, yeah, our own city code, we could follow our own code to remove our own trees on public property. Right. But and then how many complexes will want that on every beach walk, like the city manager said? So if that's going to be the case, we have two things to consider, mm -hmm. is that it may need to be done in more than one beach walk, and we need to take a look at that in doing that. And also, um, you know, as far as that's concerned, when you start with that, then the ones that are dead center in the middle of someone's view, in the middle of a complex, that DEP has said you cannot remove this, those people are gonna want to remove that as well. So I think it gets a little sticky. Mm -hmm. However, if it's city property and that's what council wants to do, then. Yeah, if we could take inventory of city property palms on the on east, I mean, just the Ridgewood stretch, just the, the right of way. Yeah. I didn't mean to interject. No, that's fine. Uh, so, it, you know, I'm going back and forth with it, knowing what we went through at my property to get it low enough and the fining that went on from the state and the things that we were told not to do. And I understand on the city, you know, right of way and the boardwalks that that'll make it neater and that kind of thing. But, you know, then how far out of bounds are we going from what DEP wants from the state because they're being stopped if it's in front of someone's condo like this. So, I don't know. Yeah, it's and, tough. And currently, too, we are maintaining those palm trees because the city, because they are on city property, um, since the city doesn't trim those palm trees, they do the ones up and down Ridgewood, but they don't trim those. We have been trimming those palm trees um, just because it's very helpful with the, you know, the roaches, the palmetto bugs, you know, things like that. Exactly. And so we do keep, we have, we're paying ourselves to keep those palm trees trimmed along with the ones on our property. So um, Dave brought up a point that one of the options is um, mitigation. Um, the tree bank provision in city code says removal of a tree in lieu of replacement per inch of DBH is $50. So if you had a 10-inch um, tree, it'd be $500 for that tree in the mitigation bank. And that mitigation bank can be used to plant elsewhere in the city. That's a tool or it can be school. used to plant another indigenous plant that's shorter mm -hmm. growth height. In, yes. To it, beautify the, the entrances to the beach, to replace the vegetation. And I think we're talking about zero trees to five. You know, we might all agree that nothing looks prettier than, you know, two coconut palms, one on each side, right? It's, or, or, those aren't even good Florida friendly, you know, <laughs> sea coastal uh, things. But from uh, the picture, right, it's you can you can see it on Washington. That's where we see that, right? You got the big po coconut palms, and uh, Tyler has one, and I can't name them all. But hey, that's me. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I think those are pretty and and nice. But it, you know, if it goes into four to five, right? And what happens when the sixth pops up this year and the mm -hmm. seventh? So we do have to have, I think, some sort of responsibility to maintain. And what got my attention was they went from zero to five. And now they're being great neighbors and pruning and keeping, keeping them in. And so at a minimum, I think, between now and, and you know, they can move on the sea grapes as far as the right of way, one third would be the most that we could do, right, on the sea grapes. I need to just visualize that. And, and from, you know, where that line would be, and understand a little bit more on the, the consequences of that. As far as the trees go, starting with one or two and trying to mitigate and thin it out for them, you know, if they could pick a couple, that might be a good approach opposed to this all or nothing, um, at least open it up. 
in Vermont. Did we see a picture of the pharmacy? She held it <laughs> up. By the way, the city did not count these trees. <laughs> if I take that. Spent, spent no dollar in creating these trees, so I question whether we even have to pay for the service yet. Okay, so these are the trees. Yeah, so she's there. got the same exact deal. Sometimes people year. plant trees too on yeah, city that's, property. That's this is <laughs> my old. mother would this do is that. 1975 <laughs> open. Right. Okay. And so see how it acts. Okay. So the trees we're talking about are here. Yes, exactly. On the north side. See how it's. And these are still trees. These look like. Oh, and that's the problem because those are treed and will be in the exact same mm. situation, I think. Because they, if you look, tree, all tree. open, yeah. tree. We take these out. Would these yeah. still there? Or change it with yeah. the it, would the sea grapes or the trees provide the bigger impact? It's it's out of the two. I'm just trying to prioritize. It seems like the sea grapes. Does it, do y'all want to pass this down down there? Oh, do they like, need it down there? Yeah. And, and then I know we're, we're at 936. Um, this has been an issue. They've been patient. And so I'm trying to figure out the best path. I was trying to see. I think the trees are there. Thank you. So if, if we can set, uh, I just take Fillmore Avenue. My request to the council is that We look to address what I heard, sort of our 20 beach entrances. Just a quick back of the napkin understanding of what we're working with. And then if we zoom in on Fillmore, and what would that look like from the ground view? And we could Each one is gonna be unique. Um, our, our history has shown that we, we are happy with it being natural. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, in some cases, in some locations, done some trimming historically. So if, if the city wants to establish the, um, a principle of we leave the right-of-ways natural, however, we can consider a request mm -hmm. for um, a condo board to fund the reduction or removal or whatever on a case-by-case -case basis. Some may want to, some may not want to. And like you said, the, the orientation of your building can make a big difference. There's mm -hmm. some right-of-ways that there's just no interest in doing anything on. But you get somebody like Windjammer or Sand Pebbles and like, yeah, we've got our whole view here is now limited to this because of this. Case-by-case mm -hmm. -case basis may be the way to consider it. So Fillmore's were the first case I think we've seen. And I, I will say this, I had another uh, constituent that is complaining of the exact same thing <laughs> on the north side of Ocean Oaks. Um, there is a lot that is a vacant lot mm -hmm. right by our beach access, or Ocean Oaks beach access and a public beach access in Harbor Heights. Yes, It is familiar. full of Brazilian pepper trees and the people on the north side of that condo complex that are on the side as well, just like this, okay. are complaining of the very same thing because the, it's grown completely over where they can't see the beach or the, the ocean. So. And that would be the first entrance. That's the Harbor Heights entrance yes. that, that comes in through the Ridgewood end. Mm -hmm. And then I would go. Well, it doesn't come in through the Ridgewood end. It's, that's a cul-de-sac. It's up off, it, off of Atlantic, mm -hmm. but Ocean Oaks is in the cul-de-sac, and then you have a that public, it used to be public walkway, mm -hmm. and then it went between Ocean Oaks and Ocean Woods. Well, on the north side of that, if you follow it around, it's now Ocean Woods. Mm -hmm. Then you have a cul-de-sac in Harbor Heights, mm -hmm. and all of that after Ocean Oaks is a lot that's overgrown, yes, and then we voted on that. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and the Brazilian red pepper just grows. It is so quickly, and it's so invasive, and it's just covering the sea yeah. oats and. So I think we have more of that know? that we need to check out. Than sea just turtle season starts when? June. June. Okay. Um, I know that you want it done. I think that the. 
idea would be to not let that date come, to, to have clarity. Uh, and I don't want to push up against it because you have to have time. But I think between now and there, this opened a lot of different questions for us. We know that we have Fillmore Avenue, but I can see that today, as we speak, palms are popping up on city property. How are we going to address that? Or any type of key? key. Like I said, I've pulled little carrot wood tucklings. You got neighbors trimming uh, city property. Ultimately, you're the manager, but when you when you got trees thinning it out, getting a case by case basis is, is I think the approach if we could start with Fillmore, that's a great place. And the nice thing to keep in mind is that uh, sea grapes do grow back. You know, that's not a forever decision to have them trimmed. Um, and as you say, palm trees grow every day in the city right away. So mayor, we could, the, you could ask your council to entertain a motion, which could be to authorize the reduction of the sea grapes on the Fillmore Avenue uh, right of way and a certain number of trees, and you could also put in the uh, mitigation $50 DVH per for every tree removed. Those are, those are your options that you could make a motion on tonight. Okay. Council, what do you think? I'm happy. If I'm okay with, um, I'm just looking. I'm okay with the, the sea grapes. I'm just undecided about the palm tree. But I, I think that if we go through the proper process, that's... I have a question. The, the sea grapes that are there in this picture, are they six foot high on... On your side. On your side? On our side, yes. So um, you wouldn't you would want to reduce them down to... 42 inches. Right. What, what happens with this back here? Well, that's the city side. So the most... And our side... The city side is over the six foot threshold, to your point, which means the most we could reduce is one third. Right. So that's what I said. I want to see mm. what one third, the estimated height, 12 foot from the ground. I have no clue, but I know if 12. six foot is 72 inches, 72 inches, a third of that would be 24. Taking that off, it would be 48 inches. 48 inches would be the height. Yes. Not 42, 48 is a third of a six foot tree. Mm -hmm. Can we just start with the sea oaks? But you're right. The sea grapes, the sea grapes. Yeah. yeah, sea grapes, start with them, do both sides, and then see what the view looks like without all that. Are you willing to see one, take one third of the sea grapes at Fillmore Avenue only? Yeah. As a test case. Mm -hmm. But I, want, I think I we think need to be careful that we stay on off of Windjammer's property line without of their... Of course. I was going to say both of the right-of-ways, but... And then, and then on the north side, but not on the south. That's going to provide... That's going to open that up. Yeah. I mean, I know there's... We're, we haven't got to the trees yet, but that's going to open... Because that, to me, is big. Now, the tops of the palms, that's why her angle... It, it, you know... Go ahead, sorry. Well, these are... I mean, these palms are really trimmed. I'm thinking when these get reduced and this gets reduced, it's going to open it up a lot. It'll, well, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, got you. But I'm just saying if we started with that and then took a look at it and then maybe you know, went one tree at a time or something. That's what I would be. Our, our trimming is scheduled for April. Um, okay. Because of, you know, we want to have everything done by before turtle season. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it still provides a lot of density. When, when you do trim them, it gets more dense down below. Right. So it provides a lot of, you know, density and coverage. And we've had sea turtles nest in there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, trying to, trying to dig their way out. I mean, we found them on the beach walk and things like that because they do come in to those sea grapes, but um, it is very dense. It's good protection for them because it does get so dense. I'm, what I'm hearing from Mayor Pro Tem is the idea that council could consider a motion to only address the sea grapes this year 
and maybe after turtle season, we could come back and look at the, uh, the uh, palm tree question separately. Yeah, it sounds like, see, let's do sea grapes first. Are we okay with the one third trimming of the sea? It's following state code and all applicable laws and, okay. Yep. No one opposed, we have consensus, and we'll just great. Want, we just wanna make sure we add to that that the contractor provide us with um, the insurance certificate with city named is also insured. Okay. And it's only limited to the city right away property, not into the neighboring condo. Okay, right, we can do that. We, we ask all of, all of our contractors have to have license and insurance. And as far as the, the trees go, uh, you know, I don't wanna say next year, I think our city arbors, Tim, and he's got a lot of knowledgeable people, is going out there and we should agree, at least today you hear, are we okay with city manager preventing new palms in that specific area from, from coming up? Because to stop the bleeding, if you will, with yeah. the palms for, for that area. There's, you, there's five today. The, today, I think, on a case-by-case -case basis, if you got some short ones popping up, that might be an opportunity to, to try and relocate or cut them if you can get to them. It, but I would say in the between now and the next meeting, if if our arbors could go out and just talk about the health of those, and if there is one or two that we can thin out and take it from five to three, yeah. that yeah. I would be open to that. Yeah. We can ask mm -hmm. the city arborist to do a report on the health of the trees, but I don't think he's gonna be willing to weigh in on certain trees should or shouldn't be removed. If they're all healthy, he's gonna say they should all stay. Yeah, if he gave a health score, which he does, I think one to 10. Yeah. Yeah, just if they're all 10s, you're exactly right. But if it's 10, 8, 9, 7, 6, yeah. number we, 6 should probably exactly. go. Exactly. Yeah, we've got some woodpeckers out there that enjoy those some of those palm trees. They pretty, have a few holes in them. And um, also, too, just to mention, you know, the beach boardwalk is not in the center of Fillmore. Mm -hmm. It's okay. more towards our property. And the north side, so I guess we have to figure, we'll have to look to see what the center of Fillmore is, and then 25 feet from that center of Fillmore, over. Yeah, that, and that's, I, I mean, I'm, I keep wanting to go back to, and I don't wanna make this onerous for the HOAs or the condo associations, but there, it, it may be advantageous to have a, a very simple application yeah. that we have, the we being the city, has an opportunity to get out there and first of all, see what's being proposed to be taken, kind of do some pre-trimming pre investigation. Okay, I found eight foot high, um, you know, so just, and, and there needs to be, I would like to see some coordination between the, the contractor and our arborist. Okay. So at least there's some. How about a recommended, some sort of recommendation application at the city manager level, not coming back to the council to approve. Understanding that the council's consensus is to authorize. Yes. The, the sea grape reduction. And that gives the contractor some sort of scope of work or framework based on our arbors. I love that. I think yeah. that's. Yeah, and then this creates now a procedure for us to handle this on a case by case basis in the future. Does that sound okay? Okay. And then so there's, we, that's the same page that. I think you were looking for, getting us on the same page. Dave Dickey, his, his department's community economic development. The tree code is under that department. So he'll come up with a form, understanding that this one will be approved for the reduction. And then we'll also get a report on the condition and the health of the palm trees to city council for the next council meeting. Yes, to rank the health of all the trees. All the trees that are in the city right of way in Fillmore Avenue, each end. Yes. Right. April is the date. That you're okay. Sometime so, in April. so our next meeting's <coughs> March, but between now and then, there's nothing I think in your way if we can get to it. Hopefully, that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, his name's. D Not just this one, but all of them is, we, 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 it would really be nice to be able to like put corners on city right of way. Where is the city right of way in relation to the, uh, the crossover and, and, and the private property lines? I mean, that, that, I think that's, so that's gotta be part of this. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get that figured out. 
Thank you, David. David Dickey, so Community much. Development Director. His card's out there. And, uh, and thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Council. That really helped with pictures. Council, that was all I had. And yes, I think uh, Fillmore Jackson Avenue, we'll talk about that at the next meeting. If there's not anything else, we're 10 till. One quick, one quick thing. <laughs> Councilmember Willis. Uh, talking about the beach at the sea oats planting, we had uh, individuals coming from the short term rentals across the dunes rather than going to the crossover. They just came straight out of the short term rentals walking across the dunes mm -hmm. to the beach and passed a stay off the, you know, it's against the law to be on the dunes, so they walked right beside that sign. I wonder if we shouldn't have those signs facing the properties on the property line so as they're coming out, they know hey, you're not supposed to be doing this. I think the be when you're on the beach, you know, you don't want to have too many signs, but it is a huge educational opportunity. Now we have it, hold on, do not, you're talking about, we have them west or east facing. Yes, but they're, but they're near the dune line. And also that dune line's moved. We, I think, need to. Well, if, if we had signs facing west mm. near the property line. I understand now, thank you, okay. Because, I've seen people just come out and just walk straight out to the beach over the dunes, creating new paths. I think the city manager has the ability to promulgate and use signs. If you're looking for a support to protect our dunes through more signage, yes, as long as it doesn't get tacky and gawky. Well, I mean, the ones that are out there now are not obtrusive. So I think anything similar, but just every so often. I would like to see more. Well, I mean, just facing where the, where the public's coming. I think if you can pinpoint some spots for the city manager. And Madison Avenue, I'll right. take you to the path, so. Council Member Willis, it sounds like we need to go have a lunch and go look at some crossovers. Okay, <laughs> I'm free tomorrow. <laughs> I, tomorrow won't work for me, but any other day, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Okay, do you think city attorney, final word, anything? Okay. How do you say good night in Most Italian? Hmm? Buonanotte. Buonanotte, meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.